right, and if it rings, it's okay. I mean, we'll cut off at that no, point. No, 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 no. You should leave it. Never edit. Oh, uh, we. Oh, edit. No, just that the only edit I do is something with with the voice, and that's it. Okay. So it uh, so it works, and with um, uh, uh, the difficulty for me speaking English. <laughs> do you usually it's, do it's the podcast in Dutch? Yes. The only, you are the first guest. So, and will you do the, this entire podcast in English then? Yes. And you won't translate it or overdub it? Nope. Good. Good. No. Everybody can. Everybody. Can. I can't do your voice into Dutch. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. impossible. Okay. All right. Uh, that, that would be really weird. <laughs> Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't have any introductions or stuff like that because it, it doesn't make sense to do that. And just go into it. I don't know. If y I know you're a podcast listener anyway. We're already recording. Of course this we are recording. Podcast. Yeah, but this is way nicer than have that introduction video thing like... My first guest. Yeah, exactly. Why? Why Do, do you like that if someone has a podcast with that? It's like, just start. Oh, you know, don't, there's, all don't, different, don't. there's all different kinds of ways to do it. I listen to some podcasts that are um, a complete conversation. Um, I listen to some that are written, like... Um, and performed. Um, I, That's a whole different vibe. Yeah, I don't enjoy yeah. one more than the other. I think they're all good. I, I don't like if they it's just a good start, medium. start with five minutes of introduction and then finally start. They just, sure. just start talking. I mean, I will cut in some music here or something and say it's, uh, it's, it's the, the... I think this is the second... Uh, the, the six. Uh, shark Talk, yeah. Great. It's, it's called Shark Talk if you didn't knew that. Shark before. Talk. Yeah. Showtime. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, so this is amazing. Uh, today we are in Duisburg. 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 However you want to say it. Something in Germany. And not far from the border at the, at the festival, the Folk Fest, Folk Festival. Mm -hmm. the Temple, Temple Folk Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something, uh, it's really difficult to. Temple Folk Festival, I think. Exactly. It That's what yeah. it looks like. Yeah. yeah. And you just came out off stage. And it was one hour of hotness. Yeah, direct sun. Mm. Direct sun in your face. Um, four to five, direct sun in the face. Um, it would have been a great idea to maybe switch the sound booth and the stage. Yeah, also for the pictures. Um, also for the pictures, but uh, you know, the uh, also the comfort of the audience is important. Um, but it. But then they have to. Th then they can't sit like they did now because it's a little yeah. small going down thing. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, so it was about a hundred. It was over. It was. A, it felt like a hundred degrees when I picked my uh, my little DI boxes up off the stage. They were like Melting. almost too hot to touch. Oh, that's not. And they're good. not. But they're not even active. They're passive power. Yeah. So it's not like they're hot because of any sort of power going through them no, uh they were just direct, the sun. direct sunlight and uh and so i'm drinking a little sugary mate soda yeah. uh to recover some uh some electrolytes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and, uh, it was it was, it was, yeah. it was it was you know every show is uh it's different is vastly different yeah, yeah. Uh, i said on stage the other night that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing again and again and expect a different result um which is exactly uh what i um, I mean, it's just different every time. I do this essentially, essentially the same thing again and again with some minor variations, and it's always, always different. So that makes me insane. Yeah, every setting. And now mm -hmm. is the big question for everyone that listened and didn't mm -hmm. read the title of the podcast. Oh. Who is talking? Mm -hmm. Because they know my voice, and only the problem is my voice, voice is English now, or at least I try. I know I'm not that good of a speaker, but <laughs> hey, the other voice is Chris Football Stelling. Uh, well, you? Yeah. I think you just, um, I think you speak great English, uh, but yeah. I've only spoken to you in English, so. Yeah, that's Spoken true. to you in English. See, I can See, barely yeah. speak English. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that's, not, that's not my first language now, my, and that's... You, you will notice. I use the easy words and not the difficult ones because I can't pronounce them. But hey, it, it works. So everyone that's listening to this podcast, mm. bear with me. I'm going to this try to do this better because there are some other podcasts also yeah, in is, English coming is, up. This so. is English Shriek. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. used to it. But the other... It's easier is, to talk to me first because we talk all the time. Yeah, we, t we, talk, all <laughs> <laughs> we talk all the time. Cool. Only when you are on stage, you don't talk to me. But Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> that's true. 
Yeah. Or uh, just bring you a whiskey and don't even notice it. Not anymore. That there's, no, no, no it's just whiskey. now water. It's just water. There are two uh, sober people here in yeah. this room now. Yeah, you were my inspiration. Yeah, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's good because it's a, it's a topic that I would like to speak about because mm. drinking on stage and off stage as a musician is something everyone needs to do it or something like that. That's really strange. As a musician, you, they expect you to drink. Everyone, the first question mm-hmm. at the merchandise stand from a guy I heard, I was standing backstage and he was like, Can I get can, you a beer? Can I get you a beer? Mm-hmm. Why not? Can I get you a Coke? Or every club owner, every, yeah. every, every night. And um, so over the years, I like drinking. Of I don't course. think there's anything wrong with drinking. Over the years, I drank more and more and more. And, uh, and then... You know, eventually I was like, man, I feel kind of like shit. And um, and so I uh, I got home from the last tour and I kind of got home and just kind of kept drinking like I was on tour. And um, yeah, it just got a little messy. You know, if you're drinking two or three bottles of wine at home on a night off by yourself, that then, just then, you, then you say, okay, let's dial it back a little bit. But, you know, in my defense, there was a... There was a sale going on at the supermarket. Three dollar <laughs> bottles of wine. There's always three a sale bottles, nine dollars. I'm getting a good deal. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's my liver is suffering, but I'm getting a good deal. Yeah, but um, th- that that's a different different problem for a different time. Yeah, and uh, you know there were some ups and downs with it, but it's been it's been six months. I also think in the genre of uh, pseudo singer songwriter folk music sort of thing there's just this yeah there's an expectation that uh that uh you know for some reason people think drinking a lot makes you a badass and um uh but i found that there's a certain amount of uh strength that is required to uh to not do this and a certain amount of uh weakness is necessary to always uh have to have this crutch so um you know, if anybody's listening to this and thinking to themselves, maybe I should take a break. And you don't have to quit forever. I'm not going to quit forever. No, of course I not. I can't wait to be able to have a glass of wine in Italy uh, on You a just river. came back from Italy. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You missed, you missed, I missed that all, I missed yeah. all the wine. Yeah. I missed all the wine. Uh, a couple of people gave me nice bottles of wine as gifts after shows, and I just said thank you. And now they're rolling around, clanking around in the, in the backseat of my car, <laughs> reminding me of all the good things I'm missing out on. Um, but yeah, I'm just taking a break and who knows what that'll lead to, but I feel, uh, better and, um, you know, six years on the road and, uh, it's six years of heavy drinking. Yeah. In the start, in the beginning, it's just like a few beers and during the, your performance, one no, it's or two, always been quite a few whiskeys. Yeah. Whiskeys. Yeah. Quite a few. And, and um, and, and it builds up. That's fine. But, uh, I think anything that anyone does again and again and again and again, one should take a break even playing shows, which I've also had a problem taking a break from. I play a lot. We both work I way too lot. Yeah. Way, way too much. Yeah. yeah. I play a lot, and, and now it's... Uh, and so I'm going to finish this tour, and I'm going to uh, dial it back. I'm going to start working on a new record and um, spend a little time at home with my family. and A new home. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I need to get some time with my my cat and uh, my lady and uh, myself. And uh, so this is the end of basically the, the itinerant Arias tour, which I've been doing. I could never pronounce that title. Itinerant. 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 I. I. Tin. Ten. Er. Er. And. And. Oh, itinerant. No. Yeah, no. An itinerant is someone that travels from place to place. Uh, you do that. Uh, to work. Well, there yeah, you go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And an aria is... is, is uh, the Italian word for um, for a, a song uh, typically sang by one voice. Yeah. So uh, there That's you also true. There you go. Yeah. It's a f- it's a fancy way of saying uh, traveling songs. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I don't. I can't a, remember it's a, it's how a, it's long. It's a little. It's, it's a little more elitist and a little less <laughs> genericana way of saying uh, traveling songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, we we know each other for many years now. Yeah. Is, is six seven years. Maybe I think about uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, five. Five, five, okay, all right. But it feels like seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends the drinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, back in the days, I, I 
have been drinking as well. Never at shows, but at home. Yeah. Oh. But uh, yeah, but five years then. And yeah. Every time, twice a year at least, you come at back. To, yeah, come back to to Europe. Mm-hmm. And when you go back home, it was or you said to me, "I gonna write a record," mm-hmm. or I have another tour coming up. Absolutely. And just what sometimes with just one or two days off in oh, between. Yeah. I it's just ins- did that. Yeah, but that's insane. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's, it it's either that or get a job. Oh yeah, that's true. And um, you know, I'm not sitting on some uh, inherited personal fortune or anything like that. You know, um, I was just always. Uh, but we are about the same age. Well, I finally had the opportunity to do what I like to do. Uh, and you grabbed it. And I, mean, I grabbed it yeah. and I really went hard. Yeah. And um, and I still get nervous when I walk away from it for a minute because you walk away from it and you're afraid that if you come back, uh, it won't be there anymore. You know? Um yeah, you told me that years ago that I have to put out a record every two years. At least. And in between, I have to be on tour to promote that album. Mm-hmm. And on tour, I write the, the new songs oh, and then I don't record know. when to I get fair, home. To be fair, I don't have to do anything. No, that's I to want you. to. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that was my plan. Uh, was just to, once I realized that I could do this and work my ass off... Um, and I had in my early twenties, I had so much energy that I had no way to uh, use, and that's a destructive thing. If you have more energy than you can put out, if you feel like it's just all boiling up in you and you have no release for it, uh, that's destructive. It could that that leads <laughs> that's that leads to drugs and that leads to um, all, all, all sorts of problems. But um, so yeah, when I found the opportunity, and also. Um, but the reason was travel. You love to travel. Uh, oh, it's the best. Yeah. I'm and, uh, my brain, there's something that feels good in my brain. And I think most creative, well, most traveling people are this way. Uh, may, maybe I've realized that I'm a combination of two different types of people, two different sort of archetypes. One being a traveling, uh, person. And one being a creative person. Some creative people hold, hold up. Well, they don't want to. They, yeah. they they love to control their environment. Creativity for them is a means of control. Like whether you're a painter or a musician, some people get off uh, on being in control and creativity allows them to do that. Some artists use their creativity to express randomness and uh, a freeing uh, lack of control, you know? This is the difference between Rembrandt and Jackson Pollock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Rembrandt is completely in control and Jackson Pollock is demonstrating his lack of control. The two different yeah. types yeah, of creative true. people. Yeah. But um, so I'm a, I, I love being creative and I love to travel. And the initial stated purpose, I'd always played guitar. I'd always written songs. And I was, uh, you know, I was in my mid 20s. I started playing gigs and I, I started playing gigs because I wanted to travel, and my idea was that I never, um, you know, I, I I was, I had passed the age where people, young people, sort of in American culture, usually go to Europe and do the thing yeah. and see the places, you know. And I would talk yeah, to yeah. kids, maybe kids that came from some sort of privilege or something, and it's like, oh yeah, I went to Paris, or oh yeah, I went to Berlin, or I've been to Barcelona. Or I've been to, you know... Um, Only the major Scan- cities. Scandinavia yeah. or, or... Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Or, or other places, you know. Or I've been to Portugal or I've been... And I would just get so... Um, and I was like, wow, oh my God, how was it? And they were like, it was okay. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, it must have been amazing. Like, because to me this would be... I mean, but who knows? Because this is something I didn't have. And, um, and I was getting afraid that I'd never be able to travel as a tourist. And I said, well, what can I do? And what I could do was play guitar. And what I could do was write songs. And so uh, I started, I moved to New York City and I started playing open mics and I started playing in the subways and I started playing any way I could. And then, um, you know, after four or five years, uh, I started getting invited to open for bands and I started doing my own small shows and I started playing in my friends' living rooms. And 
anywhere. And it's kind of crazy how fast that, um, I mean, it, it, it took, uh, well, about 10 years from, from the time I started really putting it out there until now. And of course I had done it also in my late teens and early twenties. And then I, I, uh, I quit and I went like late teens, early twenties. I started being a songwriter and having a band and doing this thing. And you then I realized, band? uh, I did at one point, um, joining someone else's band or your own oh, band. Like, well, do you want to go all the way back? Yeah, of course. Yes. Cool. Yes, please. Please. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we talk a lot, lot but I don't the, know this story. <laughs> in the beginning, in the beginning, the very beginning, um, in like second or third grade, I, uh, you know, I'm a little guy. I'm not, you know, I'm not like a sporty jockey. Uh, maybe you haven't noticed, but no, no, not necessarily, no. a, you know, I'm not going to go out for the baseball team or the no, football team. No. Um, and I came home one day and they were having a, I had a, I had a m music teacher. Um, uh, he was a, a young man at the time, um, South African man who had, had come over, uh, his family had gotten out, uh, I guess, come to the United States to escape uh, uh, the apartheid and uh, Afrikaans, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he came over and I met him. Uh, <laughs> I went to Catholic school and my, my uh, one, of the, one of the priests that ran the school, uh, my mother was an aerobics teacher, an aerobics instructor, okay? Um, like, uh, so, you know, blaring 80s music, women in leotards, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. perms, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Reeboks. The, possi the possibilities Reeboks in the 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And, and, you know, all the fitness craze of the 80s. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and so one of, uh, one of the, uh, one of the administrators of the school brought, uh, brought the, the new teacher at the school, uh, this man from South Africa, uh, to one of my mother's aerobics classes. And, uh, and I was there, I used to go to my mother's aerobics classes with her and sit in the back of the room and draw or do whatever, because I did something creative. Well, I would just, yeah. you know, we didn't have childcare. We didn't have babysitter. I mean, we did yeah. occasionally, but very rarely I would just go and sit in the back of the room and listen to the music and, and, wa yeah. and watch the people sweat <laughs> and listen to the pounding rhythm and the sweating. And it's kind of like what I do today. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so I met this man and, and he became my music teacher for second grade, I think around third grade. And he was very charismatic and very talented, extremely talented piano player and he could read music and he could improvise and tell stories. And he was like, uh, you know, I, I loved my teachers at that age. Uh, later things, you know, changed. Um, yeah. <laughs> as, as one changes and becomes a yeah. rebellious little asshole. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, around second or third grade, I, I said, uh, we, they were doing a musical and I said, I went home and I said, this was like the first time I'd really shown any interest in anything, but I was already, um, singing in church and cantering and singing in front of the people like from second, third grade, uh, you know, getting up and, and, and singing the hymns in front of yeah. the, in, in a huge church. Like it was a, a pretty big church for a uh, U.S. standard, like the, a uh, cathedral of a church. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and so, um. You know, learning those songs and singing in the choir. I probably, I, guess, I assume I sang in the choir for quite a while before I was leading things. Um, and then they were doing a musical. I said, well, I want to be in the musical. And I, I went home and and, uh, and told my parents and they were like, well, okay. If you want to do this. Yeah, if go, you want to do it, in. yeah, you should do it. Because I, I was like, uh, you know, they tried to put me in sports. And so, you know, they did a good job. They were good parents. They but, tried. They tried. Yeah, yeah, you know, but you think, let's put them in uh, sports. I don't know. He's a boy I, I don't know what he wants to do um and that was just never my it was miserable you know and um some people just need not made to do do any sports yeah 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 and um and the competition also was very uh sort of uh, this this idea of like it's just not appealing to me no. um so uh i forget well the, the first play was uh was uh well over the years you know um starting in third, fourth grade. I'd seen the older kids doing some plays. And so this, this man that came 
Mario um, that came from Mario from South Africa. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Mario Pearson um, put on plays every year, and um, we did a lot of musicals. Uh, you know, we did Andrew Lloyd Webber, we did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, we did, uh, and then the next year I went out for uh, for Tom Sawyer and an ad adaptation of Big River, and. Um, Peter Pan, I played Peter Pan, I played Tom Sawyer and Tom Sawyer because after the first couple of little plays where I was kind of in the ensemble, I had already become comfortable singing in church by being in front of people. Yeah. And um, it's a difficult thing to just do but that. But not when you start no. in second no, grade. Exactly. It's, it's, well, and with a group. I mean, singing in, in a choir. Yeah. It makes you more comfortable because uh, you're uh, not uh, the only uh, one that people are watching. Right. Yeah. And so then. Um, Yeah, and then I had some problems. Like, I guess the pro I guess the problem started <laughs> in uh, in middle school. You know, I never did well in school, and it became this thing where where uh, we had a sort of a uh, a bit of a the school started to develop a bit of a reputation for being a performing arts kind of thing, and uh, but you know, I just I think around like fourth or fifth grade, I just kind of stopped doing homework. Um. With the attitude of like, I just gave you eight hours. You want me to go home and do homework for two or three hours? Fuck off. I just gave you my entire day. What about me? Where's my time? Because it, I just remember the idea that feeling like school was so oppressive. You have to do this. You have to do that. Now you're going to, yeah, you just sat here. Yeah. And you ate uh, horrible food. Of course. And uh, at lunch. And, um, you know. And uh, we made you go out and run and do PE and all this stuff. And then you, you did all these assignments all day. And it's an eight-hour day. And now you're going to go home. And, and you're going to read all this stuff. How oppressive. Yeah. And, it, it, like, I remember from a very young age. I mean, and also I'm going to Catholic school. So it's like, you know, spending all day in church. And, like, uh, every morning we go to church. And you did your prayers And it's like, morning. oh, man. It's like, you just, like... The funny thing is adults seem to force on children uh, what they themselves need and uh, like this sort of structure, this sort of these rules. But uh, kids are uh, kids are fine. Kids are kids are. They, they come need in, to know the basics, but not everything. In, well, they come into this world perfect. Yeah, and we right. fuck them up and then we try to then we try to uh, blame, uh, them. blame them for it. Yeah. And uh, and so um, so I, you know, I started this sort of like. I don't know if it was, like, an attitude. I'm sure it's an attitude. But, um, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to do, I'm gonna, I'll go to school. I'll do just enough, you know. Yeah. And then. Uh, you don't need to do more. Yeah, you yeah, set, yeah, yeah. got the same I never degree. A, yeah, of course. I never had a problem, like, um, communicating in class or, or you know, um, uh, being involved. Uh, but when I go home, like, I want to I wanna play guitar. I want to I I do my stuff. Yeah. I want to do my stuff. Because this, what, whatever you're subjecting me to is not my stuff. <laughs> this is your stuff. This is your idea of what God is and what meaning is. This is your idea of what, what learning is. There's a lot more to life than this. And you can learn from different things and only school. Yeah. Uh, but a balance. A balance. And yeah. to me, the balance was, I give you eight hours. You I, give me I, the other, yeah, the other right. 15. That's, that's right. Uh, 16, However many yeah. there are in a day. Yeah. Mine, um, mine is so, so at some point... Um, I remember in school they tried to take this away from me. I was the guy. I was I, I was starting you to were develop. The well, I was starting to develop an identity as the kid that was doing the musicals, as the boy in the plays, you know. And I know it's only sixth or seventh grade, but it was my world. Performing had become my world. I was the, you know, I was the lead role in the plays. I was playing Tom Sawyer. I was playing Peter Pan, and these were like really cool little. There, there's nothing more charming to me than uh, some people roll their eyes about it, but there's nothing more charming to me than a. Uh, than a sort of middle school production of a, of a musical because they're great songs and um, the kids are doing it out of joy. And, uh, and I remember they tried to take this away from me, to use it as collateral uh, to make me do my homework. If you don't do your homework, you can't do the play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's luckily, uh, so I, I, I wasn't allowed to do the play in eighth grade. And luckily, uh, that same teacher that I had uh, went to a public school, left the Catholic school, went to the public high school. Um, the year I was in eighth grade when they started, uh, they, they banned me from doing any sort of, uh, but this was great because it's eighth grade and I grew my hair long and I listened to Nirvana, you know, in utero came out. So all of a sudden I had this great interest in music, right? 
And here's this guy that like feels like me, you know? Went through the same things. And Went through the same, same things, was writing about how I felt, felt persecuted for, for being sort of effeminate and being a, a man, didn't like sports, electric guitar, long hair, was born uh, the day after, had the birthday, like, uh, you know, we had the same fucking within 24-hour birthday. Yeah. So to me, so Nirvana was huge. Kurt Cobain was huge. So in eighth grade... You know, I started writing in notebooks. I started brooding, you know, being sad, but I had the music for it. You know, and I got so into this band and I, I read like Michael Azarad, uh, the writer, had this book, uh, Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, and it became my like sort of Bible and I saw so much in this band. And, um, and I was obsessed. And then um, started playing guitar around that time. My grandmother had an old classical guitar that was in the closet. That was my great, maybe great, great uncle. Uh, I bought it during the war in Spain. And uh, he was in Spain for the war. Beautiful classical guitar with mother of pearl inlay all around it. And I didn't want this guitar. I wanted an electric guitar because well, I wanted course, to be like Nirvana, Nirvana which yeah. is, this is hilarious because now I make my living with a, Acoustic with a, a classical yeah. nylon guitar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so then high school started and I was pulled out of, you know, the, the private Catholic school and put into, um, the public one, the big public school. And, you know, but that's great teacher. Yeah. But talk about, talk about a culture shock. It's totally different. Yeah, I, my first day of school, I walked up to the lunch counter and she said, what can I get you, little girl? Because, because she had long hair? Because well, I had long hair and no, obviously no beard or anything. And I was very small and frail. And I said, I'm a boy, you know, and like ran away and cried. And like, it was a big, scary school. I mean, I mean, some of these kids were huge. Of course. Huge. Yeah. I mean, with, with. Beards. I mean, kids were having. I, I just always felt so uh, small and, uh, you know, um, sort of. I mean, not scared. But, uh, so, and 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 another thing, when you're in such a big population, like uh, the the sort of elementary school, and middle school I went to, there was like fifteen, sixteen kids in each class, and there was one of each class. So all of a sudden, I'm in a class of hundreds and hundreds of kids. I don't remember how many, but a lot. A lot, yeah. And, um, and a, also a level of diversity uh, that I'd never been accustomed to, you know? Our school was like, um, sort of uh, racially, was um, probably like less white kids, you know? But this brought in a whole world of, of gospel music. And, you know, kids, yeah. um, they were bringing music from their churches. So I, I, got, I got involved in the chorus and the choir. And we're singing African hymns and we're singing gospel, Christian gospel music, you know, and I'm making all these new friends from all sorts of walks of life. And it was, it was really inspiring. And then, um, but, but also, uh, so I didn't feel, I didn't find like the, 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 the sort of increase of population threatening at all. After a while it was like, oh, it's, it was freedom. Um, But, you know, in high school, people break off into sects and identities, you know. Yeah. Like, these are the skaters. These yeah, all are the, the different groups that yeah, you belong or not belong, and yeah, yeah, you don't and, cross and, over. And, and the cool kids, you know, the football players, the cheerleaders, all this shit, which I was completely unaccustomed to. Because in my previous school, it was like you were, like, I was the weird artsy music kid, theater kid. Like, I was an island unto myself. <laughs> and... uh And then I found my people and the theater people and I got involved in that again. And um, I had been playing guitar and taking lessons and um, only briefly really, maybe for a year, every once a week for some time I would go and learn uh, in the back of uh, sort of this guy. I was convinced he was Elvis. Uh, he had a big black van that had airbrushed on it, the Midnight Rider. His name was Lee Dawson. He owned a little music store called Strings and Things. And the things in Strings and Things were actually used kitchen appliances. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so guitars, but if you needed a toaster or a blender. No problem. No problem. He fixed it. Lee had you yeah. covered. 
and uh, I took lessons from this guy Don Race, who was a, a Vietnam vet uh, who lived it. He was older, uh, a bit older. He lived at home, and he took care of his aging mother. And he taught guitar lessons a couple days a week, and he taught me some a couple Tom Petty songs. You know, I wanted to learn the Nirvana, and he was like, "Well, I'll teach you these Nirvana songs, but you're going to have to learn real chords." You know, because these Nirvana songs are mostly just bar chords, like power chords, three finger power chords. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a couple that are a little bit more than that. So he taught me some Tom Petty. He taught me a couple Nirvana songs that I wanted to learn. And that was about it. And then I uh, I started doing theater um, again. I think my first one was we did... Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat when I, I played Joseph and then we did uh, Will Rogers Follies which was huge for me and played Will Rogers and learned how to do all these or Will Rogers was an American folk hero okay. in the 30s and his thing was uh, getting up and entertaining people and talking about the news of the day while doing like uh, cowboy lasso rope tricks so I learned all these rope tricks and it was really cool and the music was cool and so I met my people and I sang in the chorus, and I sang in the choir. And uh, in 10th in grade, I, I, I joined a band. Uh, these older guys had, had a band. And they, they, wanted a, they wanted a bass player. And I was like, well, I play guitar. I don't have a bass. And they're like, well, get a bass. <laughs> Easy as that. Yeah, so I got a bass. I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'd been like kind of like building up sort of a... You know, I started off with a shitty guitar, and I mowed lawns, and I mowed lawns. My dad let me use his lawnmower, so I was mowing everybody's lawns. And, you know, in Florida, though, in the summertime, <laughs> you have to mow the lawn twice a week because the grass is so thick, and it's so hot. It's like 102 degrees, and for some reason, everybody waters their lawn. It's, everybody, it's... for some reason in Florida, likes to have big, thick <laughs> grass. So You don't see that that much in Europe. No, no, it's a waste of water. I I don't agree with it. Um, So I was mowing lawns, and I got myself a bass. And so I played with this band for what seemed like an eternity, but it was really three or four years, you know, three, three, (laughs) two years. And um, (coughs) then the idea was to make a record. So, uh, you know, we went through various incarnations. We would play shows, and there was like a venue for... Uh, young kids to play at, you know. What, what age was that then? If you're, if you're on 10th. 10th, 11th, 10th grade, I think but we was, started. What's, what's your age uh, then? If you're I have 10th. no idea. I mean, you graduate at 18. So senior year, you're like 17, 18. Junior year, you're like 16, 17. So 14, 15. 15. Okay. I think it was 15. So you were, was, were on tour when you were 14, playing the shows? Or was it well, just... not in, on in, tour. In, in <laughs> not on tour, but we started soon after. We would We would borrow my dad's truck and rent a u-haul trailer to put our gear in and we would go and play in miami or go and play in gainesville or go and play in orlando um around the state of florida oh wow no you know with a map yeah yeah with a map of course a map and a navigation system with a map and a compass and a flashlight oh wow we we, we, uh, was one big event but this is this is when i was 16 of course yeah and in my dad's defense uh, well, not defense, but in you know to 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 really put this into perspective, my dad let me borrow his truck at 16 years old to drive four hours across the state. Yeah, just go somewhere with it. This is incredible. Yeah. I have to thank him because uh, without that, wow. Yeah, um, I sure as hell wouldn't. I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't let anybody borrow my car. And, 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 but you know. Um, and so I started playing bass in this band, and it was fun. And we made a record, and then there was a uh, there was a moment. A record. We made a record. We went into a real analog recording studio in this shitty little recording studio. We made a record. And, what, and what's, we had what's, recordings. What was the genre? Uh, was it Nirvana like or? Yeah. Well, it started off that way. It was it was some kids that did this thing. You yeah, know but, what I mean? And it was lots of things. But like, if you uh, were about sixteen by then, I uh, think. You know, um, look, I just it wasn't my band. No, of course. I just wanted to be in the band. Yeah. These guys liked, uh, they, at the time, they really liked the death, the deaf tones. Okay. Right? So it was kind of like really a really bad version of, of the deaf tones. But we got... It was it, loud. The singer was good. We got a great guitar player. We kind of developed. We made a record. And then um, started playing local shows. One time, one time... Uh, but the funny thing is, we all went to different high schools in the area. Well, not all of us, but we went to a couple different high schools in the area. 
And so the way we would advertise our shows is we stole a bunch of, um, we were playing this, we had our show, we got our show at the, at the venue, you know, with the PA and it was election season. So everybody had put out the election signs all over town. Yeah. Right. And I went and stole about 15 of them and then painted them black and then stenciled like, you know, show tonight. The place was called Orbit 3000, Orbit 3000, 8 p.m. And put them out in front of all of the, uh, we might, I think we put, maybe we put our name on it, but I don't remember. And we went and put them out. Uh, and because in, um, in the States, as opposed to here, um, by the time you're 16 years old, you start driving and everybody drives to school. It's a yeah, car culture. Yeah. It's a car culture. Yeah, but you have to. It's, yeah. not, it's not like bicycles, uh, 15 minutes and you're there. I mean, we certainly, well, not everybody. I yeah. certainly could have biked to school, but I didn't. Um, so uh, we put out these, you know, we started playing our shows. And this one time, uh, a local promoter said, hey, I've got this new band. Um, and, you know, we could get a couple hundred people, you know, maybe 200 people, uh, you know. I think at this point, like, let's call it like 16, 17, you know, like junior year. Yeah. Um, and this promoter said, I have this band coming. Uh, they're on OzFest. They need, uh, do you think they could, we could put a show together? You know, and of course they made us, <laughs> they made us headline the show, which is ridiculous. Um, but they knew that, you know, they just wanted to fill the room and they knew that we would bring the kids, the local kids. Yeah. And, uh, and so we show up. And a tour bus pulls up, and it's fucking Slipknot. No. Yeah, swear You're to God. Swear no. To God. So, so Slipknot, <laughs> the nicest like redneck dudes you've ever met in your life. Oh. Um, you Why know, are they like wearing the rat, mask already? No, 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 no. no rat, rat tails, overalls, oh. like looking yeah. like yes. farmers, yeah. looking like fucking farmers, and tattoos like rednecks. Yeah. We talking to them for a minute. I think they're like, wow, these kids are young, and uh, and they go on the bus and they come out in their full jumpsuits, clown masks, and proceed to absolutely just completely destroy. Yeah, what do you know from? Yeah. Not, just, not just sonically, I mean, literally yeah, destroy yeah. the stage. This is like- That's what they do. So, yeah. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but think of this. They're playing a shitty little venue, like in the beginning, like think of an intense band, Yeah. right? You know when they're the most intense? In the beginning when they have something to prove. Yeah. So this is that Slipknot, right? Oh, wow. And then we have to, I think maybe I had some black nail polish and some eyeliner on. Oh, and I no. thought I really was, badass. I thought I was hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had all sorts but of But that little... was with Corey then already. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. First album. First yeah. album just came out. Oh. Uh, so, like, you know, you know, little, you don't, little, you, you, little you, trashy skater punk Daytona oh, Beach. That, uh, that first album, I just listened it for i don't know how many times oh yeah yeah, yeah. i loved it <laughs> i mean it was the most it was the most brutally intense thing a lot of us had heard unless you were yeah. deep into heavy yeah, yeah. metal yeah, of course it was yeah. kind of like it was kind of like a heavy metal starter kit yeah. or, or thrash metal starter yeah, yeah. kit for for people um and we weren't really a metal band at all like um i mean we wanted to be we just you know we had tiny, rock at best yeah well no yeah it was yeah, I, don't, i don't know what it was <laughs> um But yeah, then uh, there was this like TV, my senior year of high school, we made this little record in my senior year in high school. We found out about this like TV show that uh, had a website that bands could upload MP3s. Yeah, back in the days. First thing I had ever heard about an MP3. We had to like research. Uh, I mean, the internet was pretty you know, burgeoning. Um, I think search engines were new, you know, and um, it was like a... Finally, the AOL CD was yeah. out of favor. Uh, you know, I wonder how many of those are sitting in landfills now. <laughs> um, so uh, we uploaded our MP3 to this website, and people voted. Uh, and then people would vote, but they sent like an A and R to CS Play in West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, and we got picked to be on this TV show. And so the week of my the week before I graduated high school, uh, they flew my band out to Hollywood to be on this TV show. Uh, the host was Matt Penfield from MTV, the original, yes, yeah. one of the original VJs from MTV. And, um, and so they, uh, so we were on TV and it, the idea was one unsigned band was picked via people voting for the MP3. And they played with uh, bands that had recently been signed to a major record label. 
So we played on this, we were taken to Universal Studios on the soundstage. And um, it was insane. Like we played with, with uh, the lineup that day was, uh, was Eminem, Destiny's Child, MXPX, Three Doors Down, oh. Seven Dust. Oh, wow. And us. <laughs> and but all of these bands including Eminem had just like he had just come out like that he, he, he was brand new yeah um maybe not brand new yeah, yeah first first yeah. record he was like you know the the uh, please stand up song yeah um shady record yeah yeah, yeah. and uh <laughs> and uh so we did that and then we were like the hometown heroes for of a minute. course yeah I mean... we were in the newspaper and it was a big deal and uh then we started really playing some big shows and like the young kids would come to see us and we were playing small theater or theaters and stuff locally and there was a lot of expectation and we got into like a sort of a development deal uh sort of a major label bidding situation where we would we went back to la and played for all the all four of the big major record labels and um and we were but we were writing like nine eight or nine minute long like um I think by this point it's, we we wanted to, yeah by this point we wanted to be tool so oh, no yeah. we're writing yeah. like opuses uh with with very strange song structures and all sorts of uh, all, all the things Eminem and Destiny Child didn't do <laughs> all sorts of diversions <laughs> you know all of a sudden the song would take some weird time signature and do all this weird shit and uh and uh they said okay go home and write some hits go home and write us like we need a hit We if, need you, a, if you want to sign that, the major. A, if you, you want to sign yeah. for this record label, you need a hit. So they sent us home. And at this point, the band had all moved into our guitar player's house. So we're all living together. It's like a fucking reality show. But there was no cameras. And, uh, you know, we're like 18, 19, 20 years old. I was one of the youngest, you know. And, um, you know, and we had all, you know, there's a, I mean, these are fond memories of the, you know, um, you know, really, uh, I'd probably been experimenting with alcohol before, but you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're hanging out in the garage and you're, you know, you have nothing, nothing better to do than pounding, hang out. Yeah, and yeah, write we're songs. done. We're done with school. We're yeah. not in college, so we're we're drinking beer. We're having parties. You know, uh, first psychedelic experiences. You know, doing some drugs for the first time. Uh, you know, smoking a lot of weed. All this stuff, and um, and trying to learn how to write songs and uh, that kind of um did but you I get didn't, any help at that point well i didn't from a major or uh, was it like just write that hit and uh, then come had, back or we had like signed with some sharky manager in la and um the weirdest thing happened and maybe this is like pivotal to everything um and i was kind of like the uh because i was the bass player i didn't write the songs because I, i was also the youngest i was the youngest and i was the bass player and i didn't write the songs Um, but I was like the manager and I was the one that talked to, like, I was the one that did the thing that got us the TV show. I was the one that kind of pushed us to make a record, you know, found, found the resources and the money to get us to make the record. Um, did the layout for the record, did the art for the record, like, but didn't, that, that, but didn't, that you don't learn but, at school. No, no, but didn't no. write, didn't write the song. No, I was skipping school and yeah. I was driving home. I was skipping school to go home and work on the band. Yeah. Because if you remember, like this all happened senior year. Um, so then we're all living this, in this house and we're like, well, we can't write a song. And I remember like going down and, and like working. Okay. So the people that you, you know, the guy, the guy that usually writes the songs and we're all now trying to write songs and come up with things and we're all bringing songs to the table. And then it just got, you know, personalities, young young kids all living in the same house one day and um so i'm but i'm learning all these things about like sort of the management side of things and and learning how to communicate and sending the emails and think, thinking of booking shows and doing all this stuff you know and um and i didn't even really at this point i mean i'd already always been into folk music i had always been into you know nirvana after in utero uh, nirvana's unplugged record was the most beautiful thing in the world to me And For the most, I think. Yeah. It, the most beautiful record yeah. in the world, and you could see it. It wasn't just like, 
a recording. I mean, no. you could listen to the record. MTV unplugged, You could yeah. listen to the record, but you could also see it. So everything we know now, like, like it's funny. Everybody thought the La Blaga Tech videos, yeah. those sort of takeaway videos of people performing a, a live song were, were was unique in the early 2000s. No, it wasn't no. unique. Uh, what about Nirvana? What about the Unplugged series? Yeah. That was a huge thing, except it had an audience. Um, but in in this case, I learned about Lead Belly because the last song, my favorite song on, on it was the last song, which was a Lead Belly song. Uh, so who's this Lead Belly? That's an interesting name. Well, Lead Belly was a, was a folk singer. Uh, Lead Belly piled around with Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. They all hung out with Pete Seeger and the Almanac Singers and, and, um, and Bob Dylan and Dave Van Ronk and, the, and all of a sudden the village folk scene. And, and um, you start finding out that the first touring bands were touring around for the labor movement. What's the labor movement? You start educating uh, oneself. Once I, again, things it, you don't learn at school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, you don't learn no. anything in school. <laughs> um, no, no, not these things. No. Um, but it's but, a well, for me, for these are the music. thing. These yeah. are all the things for me. Yeah. And um, I mean, yeah, sure. If I had decided to go into engineering, I really would have needed algebra, right? Yeah. Um, so, and uh, and then oh, one of my friends is here. We'll talk ah. to him later. He's an amazing guy. He's seven feet tall, and every time I see him, he lends me a book. <laughs> um, so. I had gotten into folk music. I'd got, I was never really into the kind of music that we were doing, but music is music, and being in a band is being in a band, and playing an instrument is playing an instrument. At that age, it doesn't matter, right? And um, so I quit the band. Because what happened is this... We had signed a sort of a contract with this, this Hollywood manager, so we were now bound to him, but we had no mm. idea. They just gave us a contract. And, uh, and you signed as a band this, or as a person? This... Uh, well, as a band, but oh. we were all involved. And this really beautiful, I have to look this label up, but this really beautiful label from London got in touch with me, flew from, because they had seen us on the TV show, flew from London to our place and spent the weekend with us. And they were this label called Music for Nations, which was one of the bigger independent labels at the time. And they said, and, and we explained to them our situation. They said, you should work with us. You can, and they, they did, at the time actually, they did like a uh, tool and all sorts of weird stuff. And it was a, they, for Europe, I mean, not in the States, yeah, of course. but a big European label. And they said, sign with us and you can make whatever record you want to make. And you can come tour Europe. That's a and big we'll, difference we'll, in the first And offer. we're 19 years old. Yeah. And, but there's not going to be, here's the thing is there's not going to be any money. And, um, the, the sort of manager who I don't even know why we would have called him that because he didn't do anything uh, except for set up that major label showcase that inevitably led to the decline and fall of the band, which is fine, and I'm glad that worked out. Um, Music for Nation said, make any record you want. And we said, okay, and we, I, I went to this guy in Hollywood. I said, hey, man, listen, we can't do this fucking back and forth with Hollywood thing anymore. Let's go with this we're going to do this independent label. He said, no, you're not. And I said, what do you mean, no, we're not? He's like, oh, we have a contract. No, you're not. And I said, oh, shit. All of a sudden, it got real. Because what he wanted, of course, is to us to get the major record deal so we it could... It helps him. Well, he then he gets 15% yeah. yeah. of whatever the signing bonus was, which in the year 2000... It's a lot of money. It was a lot this, yeah. of money. Oh, we were already thinking about what kind of cars <laughs> we were going to get. How to spend it. Yeah, yeah. And um, so at this point... We're still talking to this label, and about a year goes by. Still playing shows, still touring around Florida, still building our thing, working on you know going into the studio and sending songs to Hollywood that ultimately would get rejected, and trying to work something out with this, trying to get out of this situation that we're in with this manager, so we can go with with the London label, right? And then nine eleven happened, and then everything shut down. Everything. Every, yeah. People say it. Yeah. People say everything shut down after 9-11, but everything shut down after 9-11. All the labels were like, we're going to have to get back to you. We're not doing anything. Everyone was afraid of anything. Everything. everything and, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and this whole time I had been working in a, like a bong shop on the beach. What's a bong shop? Sorry. Head shop. Oh. Selling, yeah. uh, doing, do, piercing ears 
selling water pipes uh, for weed smokers and uh, selling T-shirts. Because uh, this is Daytona Beach, Florida, by the way, is where I grew up. On the A1A. Okay. I had a girlfriend at the time. Me and the guitar player quit the band. Oh, I quit the band. <laughs> I, took the guitar, I took the guitar player with me. We were best friends. And the other two were you know, different. Um, so the next couple of years, we're learning what depression was. Um, smoking a lot of weed. Hanging out on the beach. Uh, Why do that? Do I, I get the idea of Tenacious D now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> having my first, having my first girlfriend, yeah. watching films. Yeah, you know, getting Just into, hang on the, on the, getting into house, things, yeah. getting into things, um, getting into Bob. You know, I'm 22 years old now. Uh, tried to go to college once, didn't work. I, I think I lasted a week. Um, and then the, this Vol- Volkswagen commercial came out, and it had a Nick Drake song in it, and I was obsessed. The finger picking. I was working at a Barnes and Noble, which is you know. Do you know Barnes and Noble? Do you have Barnes and Noble here? A big, big retail book, yeah. bookstore chain. Yeah, I think we have. Or had. Yeah, and I started reading, and I read the Beats, and I read all of everything by. I, I decided I never really got a lang. I really never got a sort of education in language or writing, so I just started. I got a job at Barnes and Noble, and I started reading, and I read all of the Beats, all of Kerouac, all of Corso. All of Ferlin Getty, all of you know, all all of William S. Burroughs, and then I got into like you know a little beyond, uh, all of Bukowski, all of Brodigan, all of John Fante. Um, I started reading a lot, and smoking a lot of weed, and working at the bookstore. Great combination. Yeah, I left the head shop. Yeah, I had all the bongs I could use <laughs> um, with a great discount <laughs> my yeah my employee discount wasn't paying off at the bong shop anymore so I went to uh, um, the book yeah the bookstore and then eventually I got a job at this great used bookstore which was owned by this old man from New York uh, Victor and um, do you want a different chair no oh, no okay. this chair's fine um, I'm sitting on a drum stool yeah exactly. um, but uh, Victor turned me into a lot of turned me on to a lot of things beyond just Poetry and literature, you know, introduces me to Krishnamurti, um, the Theosophist, metaf- you know, all sorts of metaphysics and all sorts of ideas, you know, um, philosophy and things. And, and so this was a deep bookstore. This was an independent used bookstore, not the Barnes and Noble. And uh, and around this time, uh, George Bush became president. Another great time. Another great time. Um, and right before the re-election, and I, you know, started getting kind of paranoid. I started kind of losing my mind a little bit. I was just forcing all these ideas and books and knowledge and playing guitar. Or by the way, playing guitar as much as humanly possible at this point. I'm learning how to finger pick because I had been introduced to finger picking, um, you know, through Nick Drake. And then I started working at the bookstore. And one of my favorite guitar players that played in this local blues band also worked at the bookstore. I had no idea. I started working there. I was like, wow, you were my hero when I was a kid. My dad used to take me to go see you. You know, he would show me some things and we would talk about stuff. And and um, and there was also, a, you know, probably a thousand records in the back of the, because the used bookstore also used to do used records. Yeah, that's normal. And people used to come in and, and try to sell us collections of records, but yeah. the uh, the records hadn't become cool again yet. No. Oh. This is 2000 and whatever, two, three, um, maybe four, 2004. I was there for some years. Records hadn't become cool yet. So the, the old man said, ah, if you want to make them, make them an offer, offer them a dollar a record, you know, offer them 50 cents a record if they look shitty. So I started buying records. I discovered John Fahey, the great finger style player, uh, kind of the, the inventor of what's called like American primitive, uh, which is, eh unnecessary because what he was really doing is he was listening to you know mississippi john hurt or skip james or uh you know he was a kind of a college guy and um didn't really sing but started making these instrumental guitar records in the beginning in the late 50s but getting acknowledged in the early 60s uh he eventually started a label that ended up taking on leo kotke i got into leo kotke um so instrumental guitar uh, became my world 
I got into Michael Hedges, Alex DeGrassi, all these guys that were doing some interesting things with instrumental guitar while reading because I determined that you can't really read while listening to Bob Dylan. No, true. <laughs> Too many but, words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I started I listening to a lot of instrumental guitar music and playing a lot of instrumental guitar music and I started writing and I started um, reading and I started writing songs in earnest, played some shows, you know, realized that that was, and then this, I, I realized I wasn't that good at it, but I kept working on it. And then, um, I'm still not that good. You still, uh, you're never, you're never there. If you arrive, you're done. So George Bush was getting reelected. Um, there was a lot of fear, you know, I remember Michael Moore was making the Fahrenheit 9-11 movies, all this weird cons talk of conspiracy, all of this, you know, the, you know, we're in the wake of like the Columbine shootings and, I'm, you know, you're reading too much. I'm reading like Les Chance de Matador by La Tremont. Like I'm reading scary, weird and reading Poe and reading all this weird stuff and smoking a lot of weed and getting really paranoid and, and uh, the re-election is happening and, and, no, wow, Bush is getting reelected like five hurricanes hit my hometown in like a month, like one hurricane a week. And I had a nervous breakdown. Everything came together at that point. Everything felt like it was yeah. just spinning out of control. I was 23 years old. And, um, and I realized that I was, um, I realized now that what I was experiencing was, a, was, was, a sort of a nervous breakdown, panic attacks, uh, sort of pseudo schizophrenic thinking um, and extreme paranoia, extreme, f well, paranoia based off of fear. All of a sudden the world just was, it seemed like it was just cracking open and, um, and I had to leave home, broke up with my old girlfriend, uh, moved to, Orlando, Florida. It was as far as I could get. It was an hour away. A friend introduced me to some people. Brought a creative records and brought my stuff and got a job at, at a Whole Foods market. You know, I was running away. And after eight months, it wasn't far enough, and I ran into the girl that I had been seeing. And she said, I'm going to move to Colorado. I said, good, let's go to Colorado. She said, you're going to come? I said, yeah. So we moved to Boulder, Colorado, and Boulder was a healing kind of, I was just kind of, I was just getting away from home, getting away from like my own personal fears. And, um, ah, yada, yada, yada. I built some guitars. I, I started working for a luthier. It was very therapeutic for me. I found a mentor. I worked, I built probably three guitars. I thought maybe I wanted to be a guitar builder, but I kept playing. At one point I went out to, uh, California to Alex DeGrassi, one of my favorite living guitar players who had toured and played shows with John Fahey and Robbie Basho and like the original guys in that scene. I, I saved up all of my money. I saved up $400 and I, I he was doing a workshop and I, uh, I went out to, to kind of like sit at his feet and learn a little bit about finger style. I mean, it was only a weekend, you know, he gave me some tips showed me some things, but it was more about like making a journey and, and doing something for yourself. again. That's right. Yeah. And I had finished at this point. I was like, uh, this is right before I started really uh, right before I finished building my first guitar. And by the way, I didn't mention we were obsessed with Tom Waits at this time. My friends and I are still a little bit completely, <laughs> uh, but this is in the, this is when it was all, you know, at the height of it. Yeah, I'd gone through every record. I knew everything, but it was, it was still, like, really fresh. Um, I'm out in, I'm out there in California, and Hamza El Din, I remember I woke up, and I, uh, I don't remember how I found out, because there was no internet. It was all flip phones. Maybe I heard on NPR, some, Hamza El Din, the great oud player who I was obsessed with, a uh, Nubian oud player, had passed away, and I mentioned Alex, who was doing the workshop. There was like six people there that Hamza had passed away, and uh, Alex said, wow, I knew, I knew him. I, I just remember that being special. I felt like there was like, all of a sudden I realized that 
wow, the world is small and the people that you admire are, are just people and people know each other and we're all kind of connected. There was this interest and we're in the redwoods. And I just remember this feeling of like everything's connected at that point. And I, I started beginning to heal from some of my sort of pain and anxieties. And then my, uh, I, I walked out to a payphone and I called the, my partner back in Colorado. And she said, oh, Tom Waits just announced a tour. I said, well. I said, well, write down my credit card number. I think I have like a, th I think I have $300 limit on this credit card I had just gotten. Just buy whatever tickets you can. She got tickets to Memphis and Nashville. We went and saw Tom Waits. I hitched back from California to Boulder, and then we drove all the way from Boulder, Colorado, to Memphis, Tennessee, which is far. And we went and saw Tom Waits, and it was like a, it was a moment. This must have been in 2004. Five? I could find out. It doesn't matter, though. It was the Orphans Tour, before the Glitter and Doom Tour, which was his last tour. Um, and much smaller rooms than the Glitter and Doom Tour. And the next day... I walk into Gruen's Guitars, which used to be downtown off Broadway in, in downtown Nashville. Now, since it's moved, it used to be right by the Ryman. And we're seeing Tom Waits at the Ryman. But that day before the show, I walked into the guitar shop and, uh, and his bass player, Larry Taylor, was there. And I walked up and I said, wow, Larry Taylor, you were in Canned Heat. Larry Taylor was in, in the band with, with Blind Owl who was John Fahey's roommate. Do you know what I mean? Like all it's in the span, so small, all in the yeah. span of the, these, these days and, 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 and everything was so connected. And then Tom walks in, <laughs> No, he walks right up to him. I shook his hand and, and, and that night we saw him and I sat behind a big pillar at the rhyme and I had to peek around this pillar. Mm. Of course the cheap seats are the of ones course, right yeah, behind yeah. the pillar. And a couple of years later I got to play at the Ryman with, with Ben Harper and now I'm on Tom's same record label as Tom. Isn't that crazy? It's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a literally a small world. It's a small world. Yeah, it's a small world. And if you just keep your keep your keep your shit together, don't freak out. You did freak out. I did freak yeah. out. Yeah, but I put it back together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, but that's that's important for every artist that has struggles with can, can I make it and can where where do I fit in this world? Mm. If it you takes just, a long time. Yeah, it takes a while, but you will find that way. Well, there's two ways. One is the Nirvana way, well, but you don't want that. Well, or 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 these kids that you know, say these kids that end up in these sort of uh, punk rock Ozfest or <laughs> Warped Tour band. I know I've known a lot of these kids. Yeah. You know, all of the all of this shit happened when they were like 23, 24, 25. Yeah, right. And then it's over. It's like now, what am I gonna do? And some people deal with this really well. I mean, some people go on to have great careers beyond all of this. But I, you know, there's no right and wrong way. Uh, looking back now, I'm like, I'm okay with it. I still, but but there you go. I haven't arrived yet, and that's the thing. No, you, you but you never arrive because when you do, it's the end of your life. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, you, you have a road to do and walk and. Whenever you say this yeah, is the you end, know what? This no. You but know what? Years, years and years and years later, just a couple of years ago, you know, one finds oneself. I find myself on tour with, with, with Ben Harper and playing, big the Beacon Theater or the Ryman or all these venues that he took me to. You know, this is a rare thing. I don't play rooms like this, and <laughs> I don't. You know, but but in that in that month of yeah. my life, all of a sudden you're looking at people and. Like other people, people that would be perceived as being successful, and you realize they're still hacking it out. They're still, I mean, you know, they have a certain amount of success, but they still have creative pursuits. They still have things they want to accomplish and things they want to do. Um, they have ways that they find to give back. Wouldn't that be great to have enough success to where you could raise some money for people in need or 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 contribute to something and not just worry about yourself and your career? That to me would be the ultimate amount of success. Yeah. Yeah. And then you realize, wow, it's just the beginning again. So there is no arrival. No. 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 But if, if uh, because you were skipping the last part of it, uh, uh, when you went solo, when you went to Europe for your first solo shows. 
Well, my first solo shows weren't in Europe. No, I mean, but, I, uh, but but this the, is a big. This was a big part. Self releasing my first record was a big deal. Uh, it took. Uh, I started doing these gigs at like twenty four, twenty five in New York. I started opening up. I kind of mentioned. So I went all the way back. But at the beginning, yeah. I mentioned that I started opening for yeah. bands in New yeah. York City. And this is, I'm um, 25, 26 at this point. Well, after I left Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, <laughs> of course. After we saw Tom Waits. Directly Colorado. after, just the morning soon, after. Soon yeah. after, <laughs> soon after, the person that I'd been living with in, in Colorado for those years, and I was working at a grocery store and fun, to fund my um, apprenticeship uh, for the guitar builder. Yeah. Wait, did you build your own guitar then? Quite a few, yeah. The, no, the one you play now. No. Oh, okay. Just, just. No, question. I was young. No, I, I, I was know. young and foolish. I decided to build ten string guitars and seven string guitars and all these weird guitars because for some reason, at twenty three years old, go figure, I thought I could improve upon improve upon an already perfect thing, <laughs> um, which I couldn't. But the guitars were cool. But there's nothing more perfect in the world than a six string guitar. Um, so, so you played in New York as a solo well, well, artist. I, I left Colorado. Uh, the person I was living with in Colorado broke Stayed up with there. me. Yeah. I had this really interesting memory of like working at a grocery store off of Pearl Street, looking out at there's in Boulder, Colorado. There's the, the there's a river the, that runs through town, and and um, there's a there's grass on both sides, you know. I was checking. I was I was working at this grocery store. I was checking people out. It, was, it used to be called Alfalfas, and then and now maybe it was called Wild Oats at the time, and then maybe eventually became Whole Foods. Right near the Boulder Creek. And I remember it was summer, and all the, all the street kids, all the train hopping street kids started coming through, you know, and they'd be hanging out in the park playing guitar, seeming like they didn't have a care in the world. You know, maybe some of these kids came from privilege and decided to do it. Maybe some of them came from abusive families and, and ended up being homeless, maybe for any kind of reason. And I just remember, like, you know, checking out people's groceries and seeing these kids out laying in the sun, playing guitar, doing whatever they wanted, and being like, fuck, what am I doing? What am I doing? That should be my life. Yeah. Well, Yeah. partly. But I said I should be playing music. And um, kind of went out, did a little busking. Busking is playing on the street without any yeah. uh, question yeah. ask. Just absolutely. absolutely. Go stand somewhere, play. Yeah. Yeah. And um, oh, a bunch of shit went down. It was crazy. It was a crazy summer in Colorado. I'm not going to get into it because it's. I could write a book <laughs> about this one particular little you will, summer. You will. Yeah, well, in maybe. 20, 30 years. Maybe. Um I left Colorado in a hurry. I abandoned my car. I got the fuck out of there. A friend of mine was taking a road trip to Terre Haute, Indiana. I left all the I left the guitars I built. I left all my stuff. I abandoned my car. I, I freaked out again. Um, I caught a Greyhound bus from Denver to Terre Haute, Indiana, and met my friend. She drove me to Boston. You met Jen Sweeney. She was touring with us, yeah, the photographer. I'd... Yeah. Last time in Brussels. Yeah. Uh, went up to Boston. Got a quick job. Was was staying with my friends. Actually, I was staying with the guitar player of of the of the old band, my best friend Shoney. And uh, got a job in another grocery store, checking people out. Because with, that's with, what you do in a grocery store. But I was trying to get free, and in the span of six months. All of a sudden, it was like, hey, man, uh, you going to pay rent? <laughs> I was like, fuck. <laughs> I had a couple hundred bucks. I said, oh, I got to go. I met, this, uh, I met this girl in Seattle that was trying to start a band. She wanted me to start a band with her. Okay. It's time. I took a flight out to Seattle. Got out to Seattle. Freaked out again. I think I, maybe I had been suffering from some sort of mental illness, a mix of depression, maybe slightly bipolar, probably, probably also influenced by um, all the fancy names he used these days for things that happen. Yeah, freaking out, freaked out again, moved home, 
Things got really bad. Things got really dark. Back home with my parents. I don't know how old I was, like 24. A friend of mine, uh, a girl that was working at the bookstore that I used to work at back home. The one where I learned a bunch of cool things. I was hanging out with her. She said, um, I said, hey, let's go up to Asheville, North Carolina. I got a friend there. Got in the car. We drove up to Asheville, North Carolina. I stayed there for a year. Never went home. I was home for no matter of maybe a week at my parents' house. I wasn't home anymore. Stayed in Asheville, North Carolina. Met a girl. Kind of broke me open a little bit. She was going up to up to New York. She was going up to upstate New York to go to school. I caught a riot. We we broke up because she was leaving, sort of, you know, broke up, whatever. I mean, back in the day, those things were serious. I guess they are now, too. She was going to New York. We hadn't spoken. I caught a ride to New York City with her with my guitar. Got rid of all my shit again. I had found in Asheville, North Carolina, I had found the guitar that I play. I traded in some crap, some pedals, maybe a delay pedal or something, you know. My roommate and I were like, let's play. I was playing electric guitar. My roommate and I were like, let's start his band. I said, I don't want to play music with anybody. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want to talk endlessly about what we could do. You tried it that one time and that was good. Well, again, I found yeah. myself in a situation where I'm trying to collaborate with someone And they're like, oh, but we could do, no, I want to do more this meets this. Yeah, and no. I'm like, let's just, you know what? I'm just going to do what I do, man. And uh, I got that guitar. And me and that guitar, you should have seen it. It had not a scratch on it. Somebody, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I never saw it without a scratch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. me and that guitar uh, caught a ride with my ex-girlfriend and her mom. And on their way to upstate New York, they dropped me off in... Uh, in, in, um, might have even been Scranton, Pennsylvania, outside of New York, somewhere outside of New York. And I caught a bus into New York. And, uh, at the time, Jen Sweeney, by the time I had gone from, from Boston to Seattle to Asheville, uh, Jen had moved to New York City. I met Jen, uh, when we, she's a pivotal person in my life. Um, She's laughing right now. She's <laughs> listening. <laughs> um, she knows she has to listen to this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, me and that guitar went into the city. Jen was living in the city. I slept on her floor. Finally, we got an apartment together. Our landlord completely ripped us off. The first time it rained, the entire apartment flooded. We're walking around on boards, on cinder blocks, you know. I made my first uh, recordings on a... I was working at The Strand, a bookstore in New York City. A famous bookstore, a famous used bookstore in New York City. Famous, whatever. A big bookstore in Union Square in New York City. Um, I made my first recordings of me playing my sort of finger-picking style that I had developed over so many years with my lyrics, me singing on a Panasonic tape deck a little lunchbox tape recorder. And uh, I gave them to my friend, uh, Chris Peck, who was a good friend of my friend Shoney, who I lived with in Boston. Uh, Chris took them and transferred them to digital, you know, plugged a little quarter inch and put them in and kind of sort of gave them some mastering, made them okay. Um, and put them, uh, I think I put them on like, my, I think MySpace was the thing at the time. Yeah, MySpace back in the days. Yep. If if you're an artist, yep. you had to be there. Yep, MySpace was the thing, and um, and uh, and that was the beginning. And started doing gigs in New York City. You know, uh, a couple years later, I went on my first tour, opening for uh, some friends. They had a little. They had a little. They had a band. They weren't huge, but they had you know had a little bit of press. And I went out with them and did some shows opening and. Um, And uh, and then I just never looked back. And I um, I had these demos, 
I think the, the, the title of the first EP was called uh, Shedding Light on Scattered Ashes, which is fucking lame. And then um, that was like a six song little home recording. Then I made the thing called The Songs of Christopher Paul Stelling, which was 20 songs recorded at the ex that I'd followed up to New York. Um, we had started sort of dating again back and forth uh, from upstate to New York City. And um, her friend, who who since passed away, sadly, Marina, uh, worked at the recording studio at the college. And she snuck me in there one time when I was up there. And I went in that night. Uh, she unlocked the door and let me into the recording studio. Um, I really knew how none of the shit worked. I figured it out. She helped me set it up and left me there all night. And I recorded 20 songs that night. That's insane. 20 songs that night. And that became the sort of songs of Christopher Paul Stelling, which was a little record that I made in paper bags. And everybody's like, well, you have to make a real record. And I was like, what the fuck does this mean? Like, like, it's like well, cause... you can't put them in paper bags. You you, know? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can do anything you yeah, want. Exactly. So eventually I made, I picked some of the better songs and a few more new songs off of that collection. And I started getting gigs around New York City. And I did this first tour and I, I released... Um, and I got a booking agent somehow. My buddy Spencer also, my buddy Spencer, uh, I met him on a train. He was starting to like intern at a record label and he became like my sort of manager, you know. And we started doing house concerts in bed in Brooklyn. And uh, and yeah, that was the beginning and started opening for bands at like the, the Mercury Lounge and Rockwood Music Hall and all of the pianos and all these places in New York City. Put out my first record, got a booking agent, which for some reason was a lot easier back then than it is fucking now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Time changes. I have a great agent yeah. now, but it, the business is just absolutely insane. I don't yeah. like to think about it. Um, <laughs> uh, put out that first record, and my agent, Brian Jonas, who now works for a company called High Road, and then he had an agency called Blackbird, put me on the road, booked me 100 shows, went out with that first record, got some good press, Got a little attention. Got written up in like the Village Voice and stuff. The first time you get press, it's really exciting, you know? Yeah. A little acknowledgement. Came home and got a job at a grocery store. And, and that's reality. And said, fuck. And then I made an angry record called Fall Cities, uh, which is where, you know, Brick by Brick and Every Last Extremist and it a lot of the so songs. Much... Along with the songs I still like to play. Yeah, but it has so much energy. You, you, you say it's bad energy or new um hmm? uh, how do you just pronounce it it's um it's not not fear it's well, a, i said it's angry, i said angry, anger but yeah, it wasn't yeah. really angry. it was a lot of things it but, was but anger is the energy you feel still on stage when you do the songs it's, those songs yeah it's yeah it's not the new stuff so much i've kind of no, changed yeah but it's nice to channel that but everybody gets angry i try not to write angry songs anymore i've i've sort of grown into this thing where I think I should stop being angry and start start being grateful. And it wasn't that I was angry. It was like, I really want this. And something had to come out and that's that yeah. point. And, but it's and, you know, building I still, up for years. Like a song now. like Brick by Brick, I still play every yeah. every set. And I got to stop. I got to put that one to bed. But it gets a rise out of the audience. Yeah. I got I to gotta put that one to bed. It's time. Hey, Metallica it's still ends with uh, it's <laughs> with this, with one song from the past. It's something. Sometimes you still have to just put it in one. Yeah, yeah, it and I love I love to play it, and it always gets a rise. Um, because I wouldn't write a song like that anymore. It's time. It's, I I gotta start. Stop. Gotta stop. Um, but I've held on to it because it became like an anthem. You know, it became like the drive. That song in particular became like the driving force. So Fall Cities came out. And then I started touring for real. And uh, and then when that before that record came out, I uh, I said, I, and now's the time I got to go to Europe. And I was self-releasing these these records. The first record I made with like a thousand dollars, a small loan. Second record, my great uncle had passed away, and he had he had um, left me a little bit of money. I think maybe like you know, and I pressed records, you know, and but then you know that money was all gone so you know wow and uh, you know there's a lot of people <laughs> press a cd and then it sits in a box uh they do one or two shows with it not a lot of people but you know what i mean i'm like okay so i just pressed 500 lps and a thousand cds and i have to go get rid of them 
because the couple thousand dollars that this cost, and you know, we we press the LPs, we press the CDs, but uh, I ordered all the parts separately and assembled them all myself. Printed out the that download cheaper. codes, stuffed them. Yeah. Oh yeah, it got the, yeah. it. It literally cut the cost in half. Yeah. My buddy Spencer, we had a pizza party and we had all of our friends come <laughs> over and help. There's um, a party at my place. Yeah. Uh, I didn't tell you. You have to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, here's a pizza. And I return. sent. And I sent that record before it came out. Um, a small Canadian label. My friend Shauna Cooper. Uh, uh, I met her. I don't know how I emailed her. Um, I emailed her. I was just looking at what other people were doing. People that were going. Uh, that were doing music and I, I looked at everybody that was going to Europe and I made a list of like you know seven or eight booking agents and before the record came I knew at this point that once a record was out nobody could do anything with it no exactly but I figured out that if from doing the first one I learned that if you started setting up things before the record came out you could actually get some shit going on yeah the most artists forget that point yeah they want to hurry up and put yeah, it out exactly you got to really set up this shit it takes a long time once it's out, once yeah. it's out, it's out. The yeah. moment it's the it's the lead up actually these days. It, well, it used to be the first single would come out, and then people would go buy the record at a store, and then a new single would come out. Nobody could hear the record unless they bought the whole thing. Now on release day, the whole thing is out, and I I disagree with this method. I think records should be released more like movies. First, you go to the theater, and then eventually, blah 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 blah, down oh, down yeah. down the level of theater, and then streaming, and then on TV, whatever. But even that's changing now because of streaming. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's I movies are I, released on Netflix yeah. instead. I, I will. I won't go as far to say it's ruining everything because I'm not a nostalgic person. I think we should keep moving forward. But um, it made sense back in the days. Yeah. So I I, uh, I I noticed that a couple of bands and people I knew. I think Morgan O'Kane was one of them. Um, were using this small agency in Europe called Sedate. I sent them the record. And um, I'll never forget when I got the response from him. I'm sitting on my couch. I've got my old shitty laptop. Actually, I think it was, I didn't even have a laptop at the time. I, uh, By the way, I started dating Julia before the first record came out, okay. before Songs of Prayer. This is a very important thing. Um, Julia, who's now my fiance, and has been on all of my records and all of, you know, um, my partner for life. She is amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, she helped me get my, sh you know, if, if she didn't believe in me, I probably never would have made the first record. Um, no, I probably, I definitely wouldn't have. Um, I probably would have given up many times. But I remember I checked my inbox and Sedate Bookings got back to me. And the moment that email hit my inbox, the light bulb in the ceiling above my head exploded. The light bulb exploded. And the glass came down. I don't know what the fuck, but that email popped up. I said, oh my God, because back in those days, nobody ever wrote me back. I'd send hundreds and hundreds no, of I... emails to promoters and booking agents and people and nobody would write me back. People still don't write yeah, me back. No. But that's how it works. You send hundreds of emails and you get one. Hundreds. Uh, one and uh, back, yeah. Sedate wrote me back and then all of a sudden the light bulb exploded and I came over and I did my first European tour and I did my second European tour and I did my third and I did my fourth and, and uh, I think the, the, the Fall wait, Cities the, the, I did the, at least four. Was it the first tour uh, you went to Venlo as well? Or was it the second? I don't know. We could look that up. Yeah. Probably the first one, and I played upstairs yeah. at that place that since closed there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the first tour. Yeah, that, that's where we met. Okay, yeah. <laughs> maybe it was second, but I don't know. No. It doesn't yeah. matter because they were uh, the first tour was eight shows, and then the second one was uh, maybe even five. I, I wrote a song for a museum in Groningen, yeah, the Groninger Museum. I was playing in Charlottesville, Virginia. Ah, before False Cities came out, I also did a tour with this thing called The Moth. I did a tour called The Unchained Tour, which was storytellers from The Moth. I learned a lot about storytelling. Um, Tim Manley, Peter Aguero, Michaela Bly, like all these storytellers that have, have you know, had, had 
Stories Told on the Moth, which is a very popular podcast, uh, a storytelling podcast. Anyway, they, they did a tour, and after the first record came out, I went on tour with them. And I would play in between people telling these stories, like rehearsed, scripted stories, yep. but re- true stories about their life. Well, truth bent. All good stories. And some lightning. All good you, stories. You started are, to play all in good, between. Yeah. Break it. <laughs> break it, break it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, one thing that led to another, I, 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 uh, I sent the record to Sedate. I got that European tour. False Cities came out. I toured it a bunch. And um, all of a sudden, for the very first time, I made a little bit of money on tour because there was hospitality in Europe. Yeah, shows pe- came with food. Yeah, people and a place for- to sleep. People forget that America is so different than when you're going to tour there. As a European band, it's like there's there's the door, there's the stage. Have fun with it. Do you know how many? And that's it. You know how many bands well, in in America have made it because of the hospitality they received in Europe, and we don't give anything in return. Yeah. But that being said, there's f- a lot of funding here. Indeed. And we don't have any of that. So because we live in this brutal sort of capitalistic method of if you can't make it, you don't deserve to make it. And in Europe is, we will help you until you make it. Yeah. And even when you made it, we will still help you. Yeah. Which the last part is strange, but yeah. Yeah. So anyway, three, four tours of Europe. Started making a little money. I met the guys in the low anthem. I started working on Labor Against Waste. I would work on the record. I'd go to Europe. I'd come back to the studio. I'd go back to Europe. Come back to the studio. I tracked it at the Low Anthem studio. I tracked myself at the Low Anthem's studio. And then I called Chris Peck, who actually took that those first demos and put them from, from tape onto uh, MySpace for me. I didn't even have a computer back then. I had nothing. I had no smartphone. I was wandering around New York City with a fucking Nokia... <laughs> I miss these days. Living in a flooded basement. Um, now it's only luxury. Only luxury. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I thought so for a minute, and then I took a band out on the road, and I lost everything, and now I'm rebuilding. Anyway, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> I made Labor Against Waste. But Labor Against Waste was one of the albums that define what you do now. No, yeah, I've it's, only got four, but I mean, yeah, in, but, in but, my mind, it's baby steps. Yeah, but that Songs album and scores, made such a cities. big step between well, the and first and that that's, one. That's because of the, my first record with a label. Yeah. Right. Um, that, what, what, that was anti already? That was on anti. Yeah, yeah. anti, anti. It doesn't, I don't know what to yeah. say either. I don't think they do either. Someone can email and comment. Anti, anti. anti. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. It yeah. doesn't matter. Every, it's a know, great label. It's a great label. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, some things happened with that one. You know you, that, okay, has, on. that, that that's the one song that I love which, the most. Which one? Too Far North. Oh, yeah, I still play this one. And you did today. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the fucking song. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was fantasizing about <laughs> snow and uh, the great white north. But that song, not only that song, but the album, it's it's... It touched me so much more than the first one. It it looked like it almost it was it is perfect at that point, of course. Thanks. And, and so here's yeah. what happens. Then you make oh, then you okay. then you then you make one that you really really care about, and then uh, uh, and I'm not gonna go there. Um, I I released well, Labor Against Waste. Let's talk about that big jump. I was on TV. I was on CBS played on uh, CBS Saturday morning. I played the Newport Folk Festival. Came over and did my biggest tour of Europe. I toured that record for two years solid. Solid. I'm still a little damaged. Be- because of the law of touring or because that had that so much impact? No, no, from the touring. Im- Im- touring. <laughs> Im- impact. I don't know about that, it man. It changed a lot for you. It opened a lot of things for you. It seems that way. Okay. But I was already doing at least in the okay, so at least in the uh, at least in Europe. I wouldn't really give that record too much credit because I was already doing Europe. I was already getting great shows here. It's sustained it. Look, you have to put out a new record yeah. every couple of years 
to even get the gigs. True. Hopefully you love writing songs, which I do. Um, but the shows didn't really change that much. You know, the attendance at the shows didn't really change that much. I did get a lot of, like, critical reception. But Europe had already opened up its heart to me before that record. Yeah. So yeah. if anything, I kept it going, and I went hard. I stayed in Europe. I, I did one tour in Europe for three months after that record. I did one immediately. That record came out, and I immediately came to Europe. And then I went to the States, and I did the entire U.S. And then I came back to Europe, this time for three months. And then I went back to the States and did the whole U.S. again. And then I came back to, you know what I mean? And it yeah, was yeah, back and I forth saw a lot for, of show, was, shows. Yeah, it was back and forth for two years. And um, I was drinking a lot, and, but but I was keeping my shit together. I never, I never fucked up. I never missed a show. You, you know? still had to drive, so you couldn't drink that much. Yeah, well, maybe I did some <laughs> things that I shouldn't have done a couple of times that I regret. Um, get yourself a driver. I told you before. Well, you did, and that's how. <laughs> and then, and then, it was so, so when my drinking became, uh, you know, I just got you to drive me around so I could drink as much as I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't drive. You drove. Oh everywhere. yeah, I, I'm a control freak. You Can drove I once. My oh, thanks. Um, are you sick? No. Okay, good. Why would I be sick? And if I was, I, I don't know. If you have a cold, I got, I got three more shows to do. I yeah. don't know. No. I'll catch a cold. No. Um. So, the labor against waste thing was a was a big thing for me, and um, and what I thought was going to be the end of it. You know, I haven't had many breakthrough moments. You know what I mean? It's like baby steps, baby steps, one record at a time, baby steps. Um, one of the biggest moments for me, of course, was a, a friend of mine, a mutual friend of mine, who actually is a writer that the label had hired to write my bio. John, J, Albert, um, he had grown up with Ben Harper, and he gave Ben my record, and Ben really liked it, and we talked a little bit, and uh, I said, well, maybe I could go on the road with you sometime. He said, yeah, totally. I'm in Europe, I'm playing in Milan, and I get the email that it's actually, it took about six months of... Uh, You know, These he, had a, he had a record overnight. coming yeah. out. I kind of teased it. He said, oh, that would be cool if it works out, blah, 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 blah. I finally get the email, and he introduces me to the to the tour manager and says, let's get CP set up. He calls me CP, which I think is adorable. <laughs> um, let's get him set up. Let's take him on the road. And, and it was it was a big moment for me to, after all of the years, uh, to be invited to be the first person to walk out and sing a song. Do you know what I mean? And and it made me appreciate all the people that have even 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 the the, the small acts that get to um, uh, open for me sometimes. And to some of them, some of them don't know who I am and don't give a shit, uh, and that's fine. Um, that's how but it works some of them, your exactly. Yeah. Some of them really appreciate it. And I remember the first time I'd opened at the Mercury Lounge for William Elliott Whitmore. Or like, uh, you know, I opened for Jonathan Wilson. I opened for all sorts of people over the years. But to open for Ben and to walk out in front of 5,000 people or the first couple shows were like maybe three. To play the Beacon Theater in New York City after sweating it out in New York City <laughs> and, and to not be introduced and just to walk out onto that stage to a full room or to play the Ryman Auditorium or the Tennessee Theater. So Ben did me a real solid. And um, all of a sudden... You know, the hard thing is not, there's a lot of great, there's so many great, there's there's obviously way more great musicians than there are opportunities, you know, so many more great musicians than opportunities, and a lot of it comes down to luck, and connections. And great music. Sure. Yeah. It, it it's part of it, sure. but I, well, but you have to I, have the other two steps. I as think well. there's a lot of great music. I also think there's a lot of shit, but um, <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah, you can't make great music without shitty music. <laughs> yeah, <they're weird. laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so yeah, so people so ben, that make gr shit music, please go on. So sure. <laughs> so um, so yeah, man. Ben put me in these rooms, and um, and this is something I'll. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I realized like, wow. All these years of learning how to perform, all these years of learning what I do, Training. all of a sudden I get an audience and they're captive and there's a lot of them. 
So that kept the labor against waste tour moving. I thought it was over. Ben took me out and I immediately followed up these cities two, three times. But here's the reality of it. Say you go play for like two, three thousand people. Like some of the bigger rooms were, were upwards. But say you go play for two thousand people, right? And uh, you even announce, um, hey, I'm coming back. Say you maybe even get a standing ovation or, uh, or a lot of a great reception. Sell a lot of records after that show, right? Maybe 75, 60 will come see you again. You see? So even with exposure, it's like, you know, uh, today, um, I played for what? 2,000 two two thousand people? people? Yeah. Which is crazy. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I don't think I played for 2,000 people. I'm a pretty good judge of this. I think I played for 750 people because there might be 2,000 people here, but only at the main stage listening. Yeah, I was I talking know. to the organization that was 2,000 total. Total. And I, I think I there said, was 750 I said 1,500 to be... To be nice. That, yeah. No, no, I, I, I would rather... Yeah. Um, one thing you learn in this is it's always better to underestimate because yeah. if you start overestimating now, you're going to really... Uh, because you're always going to increase these things. Yeah. So, you know, 800 people, let's say, 750, 800, maybe a little more. But, uh, you know, yeah, I sold 30 CDs or 25 CDs, 5 LPs, you know what I mean? Yeah. I made an impact. And people been... enjoyed it. It was fucking 100 degrees. But um, but at the tour with Ben, everyone comes for Ben. So the money goes to Ben if someone wants to buy an album. The most mm -hmm. of it, the majority. Oh, oh, oh you said Ben, not Ben. Man. Ben. Oh, ben. Um, no, we, we did really well on those tours. We sold a lot of records. I'm very grateful. Uh, that got me over the hump. Um, it helped me out. That tour helped me out tremendously financially. It got me enough money to where I was able to pick up Julia and I and move us down to North Carolina and get out of New York City after sweating it out there for almost 10 years. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. It was time. That's worth it. Well, I miss that city. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I thought it. you would... Well... The, the nice, the comfort, the... You don't miss the water till it's gone, you Okay. Know? And, um... I've never been to the States. I don't, so I, I don't, don't know. I don't like... Sh well, you'll, you'll come sometime. You'll, you'll come hang out. <laughs> I don't like comfort. No? You need... Well, you to need a certain to degree, I need, I need bedlam and, and chaos. <laughs> I need it. You know, um, one of the, one of the things that got me over, I think my, a lot of the anxieties that I had in my early 20s, was all of a sudden, uh, you know, in Boulder, in, in Boston, in Seattle, in Asheville, I thought I was losing my mind sometimes. I had this fire in my skull. And all of a sudden I moved to New York City and I felt with that city swirling and spinning and spitting and turning around me and the jackhammers and the taxi cabs and the horns and the subways and all of the craziness, I felt calm for the very first time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, the, I miss the city, and I'm going back, and I'm going back. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to see. Uh, I'm going to go see Ben actually for a couple of nights. He's become a friend after all this, and maybe we'll be working on something in the future. I don't know. I sound like Trump. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> maybe you should um, torture him. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go to New York City after this tour. I'm going to Portugal after this, which is amazing. You still have some shows. Uh, yeah, I got a show tomorrow. Yeah, Rotterdam. No, Rotterdam was canceled. No, seriously? Yeah, the guy booked the show. He booked a house show, yeah. and then he said, oh, I have to go to work. Oh, that's stupid. Well, I took a chance. I was like, a oh, house show would be fun, and then he, yeah, whatever. And then this happens. Whatever. You know what the funny thing is? Um, the last time I was here, the Rotterdam show got canceled. We worked with the wrong promoter. He freaked out at the last minute, was worried about selling tickets, and canceled the show. And this guy that did, the guy that saved my ass when I was with the band. Yeah put together a quick show for me right and then this time he's i thought good. let's go with him again yeah, he put yeah. together a show in a day and this time he cancels the yeah. show um but it whatever I, you know what i've only had one maybe two shows canceled in yeah. my entire career and i've played a thousand so yeah um uh but that being said i have tomorrow off and i actually need a day off you have a day off i'm gonna go see highs Oh, By the amazing. way, I mentioned yeah. today booking uh, yeah. Heiz and, and Geyer, uh, my, my angels, my sweet, sweet angels. Um, none of this. Wouldn't be possible without no, them. No, 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 no. 
Oh, started with a light bulb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it started with a light bulb. So uh, where am I? I'm in uh, uh, this is Duisburg. I have tomorrow off. Thank God. Recklin Hossen. Yeah. I I maybe I come to that show. Come on down. Yeah. Of course. That uh, would be my last show for from, this tour. Okay, so dig this. From Recklin Hossen to Bern, Switzerland, which is at least... It's a, it's it's just around the corner, of course. At least eight hours drive. Yeah, it's insane. And then the next day, I have the thirtieth <laughs> off. I, I drive from Bern. I don't know. I'm so close right now to Amsterdam. I don't. I'm going to Bern. This is how much I love what I do. Um, I'll I'll go from here, which is literally an hour and a half to the airport. So I'll drive eight hours in the wrong direction, uh, play a show, and then I'll drive uh, eleven hours back no. here. No. Back here. You're kidding me. Back here. Uh, and then I'll fly to Lisbon, and I've got a Lisbon, Coimbra, Coimbra, uh, Portugal, and Porto Alegre. And uh, Porto Alegre, I finish on the 2nd of June, and it's June. So for the very first time, I'm going to hang out in Portugal for a couple of days. Um, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, I'm going to take four days off. That's more than the last few years in total. Because I've done 200 and 35 shows now in Europe, and I've never really got to be a tourist. And Lisbon is absolutely incredible. Oh, yeah, that it's uh, a good place. I'm to kidding. Things, I yeah. say I've never gotten to be a tourist. I spent uh, yeah I spent, some couple of days off. I spent well, no, uh, Julia and I actually went oh Greece in between. Yeah, we went to we yeah. went to Athens, Greece for yeah. three weeks, which is which was uh, so. Man, but it was a vacation. It was. Yeah. It was a vacation. I did so. I went into a studio, made some recordings that I never did anything Work, with. So no vacation. No, well, sort of. Yeah, I was demoing. Um, and then uh, so now what? Now I'm here, and uh, I'm gonna go home. I finished this tour. If somebody makes me an offer I can't refuse, I'll go. <laughs> but I think this summer, I think I've earned it. I'm gonna take the summer off. I'm gonna write. I'm sober now, uh, so that changes some things about my perspective. You know, not much. I mean, and there are so a lot. Love, you can do good things. You can do good things drunk. Look, Bukowski did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Burroughs did it. But I'm I'm doing this thing. I'm going to write it out for a little while. I'm going to write. I'm going to write a record. I got some ideas. I'm going to work with someone on it. I'm going to work with a producer for the first time. Um, that can hopefully help me. Get to the next level. If I work with a producer, I don't mean make a produced record. I'm actually going to strip back. My plan is to strip back from my last record. I produced, uh, myself and Chris Peck produced, yeah. uh, Chris Peck and I, uh, I helped uh, produce the last record. Chris really did. I mean, he engineered it. And I had the band. I had Kieran and I had uh, Jordan Rose on drums, Michael Harlan on bass, and uh, they made a great record. And um, But a band is not, I had to, you know, you just, you climb. We didn't talk about itinerant arias. No, we didn't. Mm. You We're climb. And after Labor Against Waste, what was I going to do? Make another Labor Against Waste? I could never make another Labor Against Waste. Labor Against Waste was was a lot of different things put onto one record. And, and a lot of people really have a fond thing for that record. And so all I could think to do, I finished the tour with Ben Harper. I, I In between the tour with Ben Harper... And the next tour, I had two weeks before I went and did all the cities I did with Ben again to try to capture that audience. Yeah. Right? Because it doesn't make any sense if you're going to go play for 2,000 people. You better come back soon. Yeah. So I re remember your name. So every show, I flyered and I said, oh, hey, I'll be back in three weeks. So I went and did it again. I brought Kieran with me, fiddle player. And uh, I caught some fans. I caught some fans. It helped the States. It it really went from not being sure if anybody was going to show up. And also the Newport Folk Festival during the Labor Against Waste Cycle helped tremendously in New England. They've been really supportive of me. Um, so the States caught up. And um, a little bit. I mean, I'm still... <laughs> I'm still lucky to get 100 people. Do you know what I mean? But but after a decade, you would hope yeah. you could get 100 people, right? Um, a lot of bands don't make it to 100 people. Yeah, or some start off yeah. with thousands and then fall into obscurity. I'd rather play the long game. Yeah. 
Um, so, this is true though. A lot of people don't even get to do this, and, and I'm not, well, I wasn't I wasn't even expressing any sort of dissatisfaction. I'm like, yes, finally. Um, so, Labor Against Waste came out, and I was so exhausted. I'd been on tour for two years, and I wrote these songs, and I said, I don't want to. I want to. I want to lay back a little bit. And I brought in the best musicians I had, and we set up in the basement of a log cabin. My friend Eric Litcher's place, Dirt Floor Studios, in um, outside of Hamden, Connecticut, I think. Um, we brought a bunch of mics. We brought a bunch of gear. We supplemented the studio. He has a he's built his studio up now since. Um, but I wanted to go to a place with my friends people I liked and I wanted I had been gone for I hadn't had a home for two years I wanted to buy groceries I wanted to make dinner I wanted to make breakfast lunch and dinner with people in a cabin for nine days eight days I think it, maybe it was eight eight days together like summer we called it summer camp we set up on the first day we got all our sounds I had sent them the demos of the songs, and they're extremely competent musicians. I mean, much they more, are amazing. Much yeah. more competent than I am, uh, sort of theoretically. Yeah. You know, uh, skill on a skill level. Skill based, yeah. Yeah, I can come up with stuff and do my doodly doos, but these guys actually know what they're doing, um, and also have a lot of style. So we went in there, and uh, we had a couple friends swing by, and we. Uh, you know, Julie and I were mom and dad, and we made <laughs> we made breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, and it was absolutely what I needed. And uh, for eight days, for eight days, and the Trump apocalypse was looming on mm -hmm. the horizon at this time, and uh, not even looming. I think he had just actually just gotten the election. Remember the show that we played in Groningen at the at the. At the theater. Grand Theater. The Grand yeah. Theater in Groningen on Valentine's Day. I think he had just recently gotten the election. I knew it was I knew what was going I knew it was gonna happen. I absolutely knew so. You wrote a know. song about it. Yeah. And then I turned that record in, in September. Um maybe even earlier. But um I I I'm really I'm actually quite I'm just as proud, if not a little prouder, uh, from a maturity perspective, from a writing perspective. I think I think itinerant arias is 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 uh, has kind of some of the shtick. A song like "Horse" or a song like "Revenge," yes. you know that that it's kind more mature. of yeah yeah some of the folky shtick, which is coming from a sincere place, but um, you know I wanted to make more of like a sort of. Uh, I don't know, like a Nick Cave record or something, like a like a record with some real depth and substance and lack of lack of uh, shtick, and uh, I think it was accomplished. But I also think that it came out soon after, you know, re releasing. Remember when we talked when I talked about how like after nine eleven, mm -hmm. um, everything shut down. I think like after this past election. We all shut down. We all shut down emotionally. As a nation. Uh, 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 emotionally. Yeah. Physically. Some of us, I mean, uh, uh, whether we're admitting to it or now, I'm just think, I think people are starting to come out of, their, of this shell. But uh, emotionally, uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people got depressed. It really felt like after, after such an exemplary, beautiful, uh, thoughtful um, president, especially after... Eight years <laughs> yeah, of, of George, you know, of Junior, of W, and all that circus. Then you got Obama up, yeah. was amazing. He was elected in 2012, right? Which was um, oh before that, I think. 2000 and oh, that's right. No, no, yeah, he, yeah. He did eight years, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it should be 2008. Sorry. That's oh my god, eight, so nine, second, ten, eleven, twelve. The second election. Yeah. Sorry, the second election. So. Songs of Praise and Scorn, False Cities, Labor Against Waste. Who was president? So what changed? You know? Yeah. All of a sudden, I just think, 
everyone's attention was glued. I'm, look, I'm not making excuses for why I think my record didn't do what I hoped it would. But at, at some point, you just make records and you sustain. I was hoping by making a record with a band and giving a bigger, different sound, right, that I'd be able to get things up to the next level. And things did come up to the next level a bit, but what I... But different. Different. Yeah. And what I was able to do at the end of the day is I wrote some nice songs, we made a nice record, and I was able to maintain. Nothing went down. Things maintained. I had hopes, but... Um, and you had a nice trip in, in, in a tour bus with the four of you instead of being alone on tour? Well, well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's specify it. Let's specify it. Uh, there was no, there was no tour bus. There was a tour van. Tour van I don't want sorry. anybody. Sorry, sorry. I tour do van. not want no, there's, anybody there's, to think that we're traveling around there, in a tour bus. There's a difference bus. indeed. Sorry, we were sorry. in a we were in a I stinky. I should have learned it at school. Wait, we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have a van and you have a bus, but the yeah, yeah, van yeah, yeah. Uh, is mm -hmm. smaller, smaller. But you were with the four of you traveling Europe, and you did. You're uh, right. I got to bring my friends. Well? Yeah. Oh yeah. We yeah. did. We did Europe twice, and we did all of the states once, and then I think we went back to the states and did another round. Um, look, it was a good run. Uh, itinerant Arias came out, um, two years one, ago. what? Two years ago. No. Less? Yeah. One off. No. It came out a year and, uh, it came out on May 5th. Oh, really? May 5th. May 5th, 2017. Oh, wow. So, less. Just over a year. Just over a year. It's, With it's May 26th three, as we record three this. Three tours. That's a lot. Three tours of Europe? No. Well, three tours of Europe and yeah. then and then uh, at least three tours of the States. I mean I've been yeah. on I've been on the road now. Yeah. Uh, for well I took uh, I took November, December, January, February off. No. Oh. Yeah. November, December, January, February off. Um, and that's when I quit drinking. Uh, which doesn't matter. I bring it up, but it was a it's a big deal for me. I don't care. No. Whatever. When when you did it for the first time, it's whatever, a big man. Deal. I I after yeah after after years and years and years, I did a tour without alcohol, and yeah. I'm gonna pat myself on the back for that. Yeah, but uh, I can't reach you. I I'm not you trying. Get... I'm not trying to sound like an elitist or, or no, something. No, but this, it is something people forget that. Yeah, um, well, especially when it's your crutch. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I've gotten rid of the crutch, walking on my own a little. But well, what did you hope for with with the band? That you play I hope the band would be able to sustain itself. Okay. I hope the band would be able to go on the road and uh I mean I never even got to take out a drummer. No. I uh, obviously no, the record obviously the record had a drummer. The reason I, I replaced the rhythm section on I kept Kieran and Julia mm -hmm. and I replaced the rhythm section, Michael and Jordan, who we refer to during the recording process as yeah. Michael Jordan because they're fucking <laughs> incredible. Um uh, with with Matt Murphy, uh, who plays upright bass in yeah. more of a rockabilly slap style, yeah. uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to afford a fourth person. Uh, well, I'm the fourth person, but you know, yeah, I know the fifth or, person. Yeah, 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 I didn't. I because knew I, it means a different van means a different. Well, no, we could have done it with the van. It just means paying another person, yeah, but paying for another person, another set of plane tickets. So I, I I figured out pretty quickly when I crunched the numbers. Um, that I would have gotten pretty screwed had I brought out drums as well. And what I didn't realize is, um, man, dealing with sound systems is hard enough. And if you want to add a drummer, it's oh a my whole God. different thing. Oh, my God. I, I, so what this process of touring the band taught me is how much I love folk music. <laughs> <laughs> how much I love really... I mean, I was burnt out, and I needed to travel with some people, and I needed to play with some people, and it was great. And I got to bring Matt and Kieran and Julia to Europe, I was able to pay for everything, you know. We, uh, well, I definitely, uh, financially, it was hard. Um, at the end of tour, which is also why I quit drinking. So at the end of tour, I went home, and it basically sustained itself for the for the time that we were on the road. And I got home, and um, and that was it. You know, I got home, and and. Uh, with only enough money to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to be okay for like a month and I got to figure something out, you know? And I was drinking a lot because I was kind of upset because I was like, fuck, I just worked my ass off for a year and now I'm broke. 
for the first time because Labor Against Waste, I was touring by myself. I came home with, with enough money to be okay for a minute. Yeah. And people don't like to talk about money, but I think they should. Yeah. And I think they should from an honest and from a, um, a, per- a, a real perspective place because one of the things that young musicians ask me more than anything is how do you afford it? They know how to make music. They don't give a shit about how to write a song. They're like, how do you make it work? That's what they want to know. They don't give a shit. They have their own artistic vision. But there's a way to make it work financially that has nothing to do with creativity. Creativity. Well, that's not true at all. You have to be extremely (laughs) creative to make it work financially. Yeah. Um, You have to be extremely flexible. Uh, So, um, once again, uh, my beautiful sedate booking and my beautiful flannel and beard booking in, uh, in the US. Uh, we got a tour together, I did 25 shows in the States, or maybe 30. This tour is about 26, 27 shows. And so I'm out working my ass off to make a little scratch so I can go home and write a new record. So I can go home and sit. Yeah. And, and so have sit the time to make that so record. I can, because time is money, man. Yeah. Money is time. And um, it can buy you time. You know, it can pay your rent while yes, you sit indeed. at your. It could. It could pay your rent while you sit at your desk. And uh, otherwise, you have to work at the grocery store and make a record and do this. Is, and do you know how many people do that? Yeah. everybody does that. Yeah, everybody but does that. But they not don't. having to work means you have eight hours a day more. What I'm scared of is I'd have to go and apply for a job, and they'd be like, "So uh, <laughs> we see you haven't. What have you been doing for the past six <laughs> years? Uh, <laughs> what do you think makes you qualified for this uh, cashier position?" And I'd say, "Well, I've been on tour for the past six years. I know how to work money." <laughs> I counted every night. No. Oh, come on. <laughs> Count the coins. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I'm working my ass off still. I've had some success. I've had some failures. I'm working my ass off. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a new record. And I think it's going to be great. And, um, but, you know, the That's thing is. That's a new is, baby step. So, there you, exactly, a new baby step. <laughs> So I've done two records for Anti now, you know. I got one more on my deal. If they take it, they have the option. So, you, so that means you make a record, you send it to them, and they decide if it's going to be re- released? There's a, variety, there's a variety of ways it could, <coughs> it could work. But they, they have the first, uh, the they first have, option. They have the first yeah. option. Um, but if you make it and they, they say no, why would they? But then you can go shopping around. It's not that they own the record at that point already. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, hopefully, if they're kind. <laughs> I think they're going to put it out. Um, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. You should never be too... <coughs> one thing I learned about this is you should never be too sure. Um, but uh, I've got... I've enlisted some some good you help. Pro- yeah, you prove for yourself. And the next step is... Well, I've I've made some records now. There's a reason I've, why. Yeah, yeah, and I've, en- I've enlisted the help of a friend that's, <laughs> a, that's made a lot of records and is, is a great producer. And I think is... Uh, in the beginning stages of writing this record, I've been sending demos to him, and his his notes are beautiful. Yeah. They're so simple. Every help helps, He's not yeah. telling me to do anything. He said, you know what, he, the first song I sent him, he said, why don't you slow this down like 20 BPM? I slowed it down, and it, it freaked me out. All of a sudden, it worked, and I was like, wow. Like, you know, little, little tweaks. Little tweaks. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not going to, as far as I know, I'm not going to make a full band record. I'm going to return to... More solo of, again. More of my well, not solo. I, I got some. I got you some get tricks. some help. And I got some tricks. Yeah. I got some ideas. Um, I'm going to try to continue with my more mature approach that I went for. And not that labor was not mature. I still play a lot of these songs. But uh, look, I'm going to do the best I can, and um, I'm going to try to put myself into it and uh, in, in another step. But do you do you think? Uh, no, do you look? ahead a long time or is it just like do, do you plan out 10 years or is it just like if i looked ahead too far i wouldn't be doing this okay so just record to record to record and what in between is tours tours and tours record to d- record yeah. day to day oh wow day to day i mean well but you got you i mean look how lucky i am you, you, with that luck with this thing that i get to do i get to go play shows for people i get to travel half the world not all of it yet. No, I haven't been. There's some places I haven't been. If you're yeah. listening, Australia or New Zealand or Japan, I would 
I would love to come to you. Um, there are places I'd still like to go. I'd like to get, there's parts of Eastern Europe I haven't been to, you know, um, so much of Eastern Europe I haven't been to. I've been all over Western Europe, so much of Eastern Europe. It, se <laughs> it seems a little bit more risky and a little bit more, maybe a slightly more dangerous and amazing and crazy and less Western. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love Balkan music. I love, I love, I love, uh, I love Eastern European music. So there are places over there I want to get. Um, the next tour. Or yeah, absolutely. After. Absolutely. Um, there's so much more I want to do, you know, and uh, so many more things I want to experiment with musically. I love getting up in front of people and singing. And one of the things that my recent change in lifestyle has taught me is just how lucky I am to even be even in this at all. The journey has been quite epic and um and i'm uh not to sound cheesy or uh, even remotely uh i'm really been really blessed and some of the things that i thought were my greatest fears that i had to overcome on this short sort of journey uh ended up being sort of blessings in disguise and uh it's pretty cool you know it's it's amazing it, i mean your story your stories is it's uh, breathtaking mm -hmm. and it's uh it's also you know, very simple though it makes total sense to, yeah it's not too crazy is no it? but you i mean i see you every night that i see you on stage you tell a story you're a great storyteller Thanks. i mean your music is storytelling mm. and um with 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 this background it is even more like amazing to hear where you're standing now and how you grew from the beginning of the church singing <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to to the singing now it still feels the same yeah but uh do you still believe i mean in I s in a god or in a higher place or how do you call it in in america i don't know totally i mean i i don't believe you anymore. have to i sing in a choir <laughs> back in the days as well yeah and uh in a church and I believed until I was, I think, 16, 17, something like that, and then dropped out quickly. Sure. <laughs> and since then, I never believed anymore. Mm -hmm. But since one year, I think one year, mm -hmm. I started listening to Christian music again, Christian uh, uh, pop music. I hope this doesn't get weird. No, it doesn't get weird. No, <laughs> but it's, it has so much energy and power in it yeah. that I don't see back in modern pop anymore. Uh, the modern pop is so standard and... It's it's nothing new. Yeah. It has no... Well, I could recommend some great... What uh, do you listen to? Me? Well, yeah. we were kind of talking about like... You only mu listen music. to podcasts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true. Yeah, but uh, lately, I've been listening to a lot of like recordings by like Sister Rosetta Tharp, who was one of the first, like, actually uh, one of the first electric guitar players, who's a black woman, uh, led a gospel choir, was a gospel singer, um, also one of the first electric guitar players. I think actually this year she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it was a record I liked a lot a long time ago and I'm, I'm back into it again. Um, but do you listen to new music then? New music? Yeah. I'll, I'm, I have a tendency more to listen to the same record a hundred times than I would listen to. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of these people like some of my friends that are constantly listening to everything that's new. Yeah. I have records that I love and... Um, I'm some what of a monogamist with music, you know. I'm not. I'm not seeing other people, you know. I'm not dating around. I'm not into polygamy. <laughs> I have things that I love, and I'll go back to them and okay. back to them. And occasionally, something will really knock me out. Yeah, we'll and stand I'll, up. I'll go back to it. Yeah. But you asked an interesting question, and about about belief. Maybe you are it. Sure. Yeah. Maybe we're all. Maybe, maybe we're everyone is their own personal god, and everyone around them is 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 a manifestation of something that is beyond. Is beyond, but, you, but we were talking about luck I, as well. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything disrespectful in saying I don't know. I think the concept of faith and blind faith. Um, there's a difference between having faith that things are going to work out and having faith in that there is something uh, that ties us all together and makes us all part of the same experience. There's something beautiful in that. 
but I don't think one has to have faith in, um, in, 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 in being certain about what that is and what the rule book is. I mean, we know what the rule book is. Just be, don't be an asshole. Yeah. That's the rule book. <laughs> don't be try like to our be president. Kind. Well, yeah. try to be kind. Try to have patience. And help people. And, and don't just forgive other people. Forgive yourself. And, and help people. And just, you know, you're going to get angry. You know, it's something happened recently. I'm driving in the car. And I feel like I have anger all figured out. I feel like I got to this place. All of a sudden, I got all this boost of confidence where I thought I could never be angry again. I, I'm full of gratitude and I'm full of peace. And that day, I experienced probably the most anger that I had experienced in quite a long time. <laughs> so Traffic jams. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like when I was drinking, if I said I was taking a night off and I went out, I would probably get more drunk that night yeah. uh, than, than ever. Um, so I don't... Uh, I believe in this experience. I believe in this life. That's enough. I'm completely... Um, I think ag agnostic is the right term. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not an atheist. I don't believe in nothing. I mean, this is definitely happening. <laughs> this is happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, but do I subscribe to any sort of religion? No. It's, uh, you don't need to. I mean, uh, some people are really into a church or into a God or find find a way to... Get it get signed. And there's there's something beautiful. <laughs> other look, people there, are just look. There's a beautiful there's a beautiful thing to be said about community. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Henry Miller once said that maybe God needs us more than we need him. Never heard that, but it's it's <laughs> I mean, strong. Hey, yeah. It's wrong. No, it's strong. Strong. Oh, strong. strong. So, see, yes. My bad English. No, maybe it's wrong. wrong. Maybe no. it's strong. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's um. The last year, I was uh, I was thinking, why did I uh, stop believing or believing in God in the, in this case? Mm -hmm. But when I listen to music, everyone that I tell it, they start start laughing because you're listening to Christian music, and it's like, yeah, but listen to the music. It's the music that's applying to me, not the song, uh, the the lyrics or whatever. I don't care about it. Well, you find it uplifting. But it's and that's it's the, amazing. Yeah. But this is the but this is the point of the music, isn't it? Yeah. The point of the music is to inspire people, uplift them. And one of the sinister things I find about religious music at times, especially the more corporate uh, religious music, is yeah. it gets you really excited and then they pass the hat. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But guess what? I get people excited and, and then I pass the hat too. Yeah. And um Hopefully that organization is doing a little bit more uh, charitable good. Um, who knows? Yeah, by, by, but by, maybe I shouldn't pay taxes either, since I'm doing essentially the same oh, thing. True. Yeah, that's that's the <laughs> whole thing I, I heard about it. That uh, that that Hillsong didn't pay taxes or don't need to pay taxes because they are a church. But uh, it's on a, music. Yeah, well, it's a great so, way. Yeah. It's a great. Uh, God is a big business. Yeah, and um, and. Uh, that's interesting that you enjoy the music. You should try some old gospel music, yeah, some of the old. Just stuff. send me some. I, I, will. I will. I, I mean, I, that's the that's the the thing. How to um, get to new music and but new I love music I love I love I love that you uh, I love that you uh, seem more convinced by the music than you do by the religion itself. Yeah, but, but why need do I need to be into that religion? I mean, <laughs> I I love music. Yeah, but I love music, and if it's music, if that's, that's what does it for you. Then hey, yeah. Exactly. Oh man, I, and, I mean, I love. But there's also the reason why I can listen to so many different styles. Yeah, a lot of people are just only into uh, into. blues or only into trance music or only into yeah. pop music. Yeah, and I say, but listen to this as just music. You know what you should love is uh, uh, what you maybe would love is uh, I love the I love the period when Bob Dylan decided that he was going to make Christian music. Uh, it's fascinating. Shot of love. Oh mercy. Uh, slow train coming. Some of these, some of these uh, Bob Dylan's Christian records are uh, fantastic. <laughs> maybe he just was just. Amazing. And you know what? I think it was. Um, maybe he did have a real experience of faith and belief, or maybe he experienced the same thing you did when he listened to that music and said, "God, this makes me feel good." Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and maybe he was just wearing another mask. Who knows? <laughs> I uh, bought my first tickets for a, uh, for a, a concert from a Christian pop band. Oh, gosh. Yeah. They're going to play a sold-out uh, uh, show. Three sold-out shows, in fact. Uh, in Holland. Well, and I hope uh, I don't lose you, buddy. I hope you don't go. No, uh, no, no. I just want <laughs> to experience how that works. Because one, why did they sell out that fast? How is it possible that I never heard it in Holland before? And how does that thing work? Is is it, is it? Will there be uh, a preacher? And will there be a yeah, man, real different experience for a normal concert person? Yeah. Or how does it work? So, and today. Um, uh, in Holland is one of the biggest uh, things. Uh, all the youth gather together in a stadium. It's 35,000 people, I think, mm -hmm. that are uh, for God. It, I don't know. I can't remember the name. But it's a big event for the youth that believe in God. And they gather in a stadium. I mean, I see the Hillsong things that are stadiums. But in Holland, I mean, never heard of it. Mm. I know that exists, but shows mm. in my region, I don't ever see a show that's uh, believing in anything, uh, as in, in uh, faith. How do you say mm. that? Yeah, we have I just don't know. normal I, shows. You know, the, 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 the <coughs> people getting together and believing in one thing kind of freaks me out. Yeah, I see a funniness to it. I just, even though I'm, a, even though I uh, try to remain optimistic about everything. Um, too many is too many. Well, saying 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 yes is the same as saying no. We should all just be saying maybe, uh, because because I just I'm not necessarily convinced that a lot of the people pulling the strings behind a lot of these organizations actually believe what they're selling. Yeah. Because I don't know, man. I've looked pretty deep into it, <laughs> and I'm not 100 percent convinced. <laughs> no. So how could anybody be? No. I mean, not that not that my uh, but that's, that's not that my assessment not that my assessment is greater or less than than anybody else's. But no, but that's what, I, what I'm saying. I I listen it for the music and not for the belief or the other things. Yeah, I can listen to any music, and I don't know if the corporates are interesting in. They just want to sell. Make no, if you're just selling thirty-five sell. thousand tickets, somebody's making an awful lot of money. Yeah, of course. But <laughs> how to make a production work is something that I'm learning at this moment in school. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if it's a Christian belief gathering, or, or if it's a Bruce big, big Springsteen, of right? Bruce Springsteen. That that works the same. Of course, people are making money from it, and that's how it should be because otherwise you won't get an event. If this festival makes no money, there's no event next year. Mm -hmm. That easy. Well, so the, the the basics are always the same. Only the reason why you do it, yeah, will well, change. I'm gonna go see Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, are you? No. No. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if I had to choose between the two, I think Bruce Springsteen okay, would be okay. my church. Even though I'm not even a necessarily a fan of. Well, well I'm thinking, I, I didn't. See I'm Bruce just now. Though. I'm just now starting to. Uh, I see the stone. I saw the stones once at people, yeah. but never Bruce Springsteen. No, the biggest artist no. I've probably seen that I cared about was Tom. Yeah. And um, I've never seen Bruce. I've never. I've seen Dylan. I've seen Dylan twice. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, but I'm no no Stones fan. Let's make that. Clear, you really don't like clear. the Rolling Stones? No, I don't like all those things. I just don't. But I do like how it works. I think you could get into the Rolling Stones. No, really not. No, Have you? The same as the Beatles Have and you? stuff. Oh, no. I'm not a big Beatles fan. No, it's, it's just not for me. But we just lost all of our audience. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. I, the people stay listening. But now, I mean, I'm uh, back in the days, and still I'm a Bexy Boys fan. And everyone is like, yeah, you're looking at me at the right side. Good night, everyone. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for listening. <laughs> my name is Christopher Paul Stelling, and this is my host. You're listening to Shark Talk. And uh, You we'll really want to quit here we'll at this it. point? Yeah, 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 I do, actually. <laughs> no. Yeah. Why? I don't want to talk about pop music. I no, just gave no. you my entire life story. I don't want to talk about the Backstreet Boys. No, no, you don't, we don't need to. <laughs> Christian Come on. Rock. I can, I, can, I can do that. <laughs> Where is this gone? Uh, I'll just cut everything out of before the Christian music and just put this back in. Okay, great. No, no, <laughs> no of course not. You don't, <laughs> you know, no, you know, you know, I'm not going to do that. No, but I mean, it's, it's so, such a different thing that if you grew up with no Rolling Stones, with no Beatles, with no uh, Bob Dylan, with no Tom Waits, how are you getting into it? That's the only thing I want to say. That's why I mentioned the Mexican voice, but it's, well, it's difficult if there's no one around you saying, maybe you should listen to this. Mm. 
You're uh, not gonna start listening to it. No, I think I think music I think music and the appreciation of music is inherently uh, buried deep within us. And I think if uh, if if you took a person now, I don't believe that we should experiment with life at all <laughs> to a but certain let's degree. Try. <laughs> but no, I think I think if you took a person and you um if you took a baby, a newborn baby, uh, maybe people have done sick experiments in the past, but maybe this is one they've done, but I doubt it. I don't know. I think if you found a way to raise people, and this is just theoretical, if you found a way to raise people outside the influence of any sort of society at all in any sort of language, they would probably develop music before they would develop a language. I just believe this. I think somebody would tap, somebody would hum. It's the first thing you can hear. I think it would happen before language. Yeah. And I think music is older than language. And I think what gets called music is not necessarily really music anymore to some degrees. Um, and maybe even the stuff I do, I think. Uh, but I think the the basic tenets, the basic concept of music is, is, is a really naturally occurring thing. It has to do with rhythm, it has to do with time, it has to do with our heartbeat, it has to do with blood pumping, it has to do with our voices, it has to do with noticing that things go up and down and in pitch in one's voice, it has to do with, I, I, I would think the way that we talk and the way that we speak with rhythm and the way that words come out of our mouth probably came from music. I don't think music came from, I don't think, I don't think music came from language is what I'm trying to say, I think yeah. language came from music. Yeah. Um, that's it, I, you know. Uh, so, so how would anybody do anything unless they were in 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 in, in um unless they were uh, introduced to it? I guess what I was kind of thinking is you got to sell music to sustain music. But when music becomes a vehicle for selling an idea or a concept or a religion or something like that, even though the earliest, a lot of the earliest music was founded by this, but things become propaganda at a certain point. That's when I get a little uneasy. Yeah. I think music can be music. I mean, music that just expresses all of the things. And this is why music has kind of become my little, my little religion in a way. Um, and being able to reenact some of my darkest moments, some of my happiest moments, some of my most uncertain moments and having these songs and being able to sing them and being able to catch glimpses of that is like looking in a mirror of my mind sometimes. And thankfully I get to do that to entertain other people. Sometimes I wonder if music can be more than just entertainment for the people that are watching it. And sometimes I think maybe it just all comes down to the fact that I'm entertaining people. But I don't think so because I've had people really show me real human emotion in return. And I've had people actually express genuine, uh, all sorts of emotions. Some people have gotten angry at me. Some people have been very grateful. Some people have cried. Some people have told me that, you know. Yeah, with Too Far North, I'm just done. Mm. If, that, if that's on, uh, on uh, the radio or you're singing it. Thanks. It's just still giving me the chills. I've had, I've had people come to shows that were soldiers in Iraq telling me about personal things and how m my music has helped them. I've had people, you know, uh, tell me really, really dark times that they've been, that they've gotten through. Um, and I, I believe them. Um, I mean, I'm not saying, you, you know what I mean? I mean, if somebody would come and say this to you, there's no reason to second guess. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise it, it you would wouldn't take come a lot to of, you. Yeah. It would take a lot of guts yeah. for me to come up to somebody and say that. Um, so I'd like to think music is more than entertainment. I'd like to think all of this matters. I'd like to think maybe someday a long time from now when I'm gone, some kid is going to pick up a record. You know, let's, <laughs> let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. I'm not going to be the Rolling Stones. I'm not going to be Bob Dylan. I'm not going to be Nick Drake. Nobody's going to, you know, there there very well might come a time after all this effort, after all this touring, after all these songs, after all these records, that it all kind of fades into obscurity. And maybe one kid will pick up a record. Your records. Maybe. Yeah. 
And maybe it'll just inspire that kid to write a song, or maybe it'll help that kid get through his day, or maybe it'll help make somebody's day better, and maybe somebody will say, wow, I know about this thing and nobody else knows about it. Maybe people, you know, but there are people that, that care now after some time. There's not many of them, but there are people that care about what I do, and I'm really grateful. And, um, and I'm just going to keep, but that worrying about that shit, who cares? I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and enjoying my life and leave, leave, uh, what comes next to what comes next. It's amazing, uh, to end it here. I think. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, I got to so stand up and stretch. Yeah. We, we both do. I think, okay. uh, but, uh, I want to thank you for Thanks being for the first English guest on yeah. this podcast. Thanks for being uh, my number one uh, <laughs> my number one in Europe. You've, you've seen me more times than probably my own mother at this point. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it was amazing to talk to you and li listen to you because you talk most of times. And it's amazing sorry to hear. No, no, not saying sorry. <laughs> because it's so inspiring and I hope that a lot of uh, musicians listen to this as well. No. And that they hear such a story and get the inspiration to keep going and not just stop after one record because uh, it didn't sell really good uh, or whatever. And that this helps other people to... Me too. To, to get yeah. going. And yeah. indeed, that one record can make that one kid that can pick up that record. Or yeah. Well, thanks for yeah. talking to me and getting me to tell the story a little bit mm -hmm. that I've never really had the chance to sit down and tell. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can do that next time on stage. We make just a two and a half hour set. Oh, yeah. And you just tell, tell the story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'd be a real tough crowd. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in the, in the hot sun. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in the hot sun, 100 degrees. Speaking yeah. of the hot sun, yeah. it's kind of cold in here. Yeah, let's go uh, outside. Okay, hey, buddy. Thank you very yeah. much. And for everyone that uh, listened to the podcast, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, please leave a comment in, in, in iTunes uh, podcast app. That will uh, help me a lot uh, to reach other people as well. And uh, uh, let me know what you think of uh, my first English uh, podcast because there's coming up uh, one uh, next week as well. See you then. Do we? <laughs>